Good morning, everybody. I'd like to call to order the May 31st budget hearing. The Board of Supervisors, if we could begin with a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig. Here. Cummings. Here. Hernandez. Present. McPherson. And friend. Here. And if we could begin with the Pledge of Allegiance, please stand, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic, to the nation, under God, Good morning, Mr. Palacios. Are there any changes to today's agenda? Uh, we have no changes to the agenda. All right, thank you. We're going to begin with uh, another overview from our budget manager, Mr. Pimentel. Mr. Pimentel, good morning and welcome back. Nice tie. <laughs> Good morning, Chair Friend and Board of Supervisors. Uh, I'm Marcus Pimentel, your County Budget Manager. I'll be starting today's uh, budget hearings with an overview of our public safety and land use and community services departments. As I go through these first slides, they're gonna look uh, very familiar. The first six are repeated from our May 9th uh, budget hearings, um, but up with slide updates and we're re are repeats from yesterday's hearings. We're just keeping them as an overview for consistency. Um, today's agenda entirely for the day will begin with my pr proposed budget overview of public safety and justice in the land use and community services departments, including infrastructure and capital projects. Uh, on consent, following my presentation, the consent items for consideration will be that those departments in public safety and justice and land use and community services that are not included in the uh, departmental presentations. Um, we'll then have presentations to conclude the public safety and justice section by district, our district attorney and public administrator in the sheriff corner. We'll move into land use and community services with parks, open spaces, and cultural services. The community development and infrastructure department that includes planning, housing, and, and, and public works, and conclude the day with uh, capital projects. These hearings will then be continued to our, our fourth hearing on June 13th, 2023. That will consider the last day items, unified fee schedule, containing agreements, and the concluding actions for approval of the budget. Again, these next slides are repeats from May 9th and from yesterday. Um, as this board knows, and we've talked about uh, considerably and this board has provided guidance on, our county is systematically underfunded and challenged. Um, we receive less than sales tax dollars, less than property tax dollars than our peers. Our sales tax is declining and moving to other jurisdictions who have online fulfillment centers, warehouses, we're losing about $5 million a year on online sales tax. Our property tax, if we were funded at the same level as some of our peers, including our neighbor in Monterey County, would be $79 million more in the general fund a year. So considerably, that's, that's, a big, that's a big starting negative position we're starting in at $84 million behind um, before we even start to build our budget. Uh, we are a county, like most counties and, and cities and districts, that are struggling to address our deferred aging infrastructure. Um, we do and have been making progress over these last couple of years of finding opportunities of leveraging federal and state funding to build facilities. And also uh, like with the model of our South County Government Center, funding that through uh, reductions and eliminations of lease rates. So we're essentially cost neutral. We should build up some savings from that project, but we've had to be very uh, creative and uh, fiduciary uh, uh, smart in, in moving forward with building our facilities. We've also and, and talked about considerably the cost of our disasters. While in the last year and a half, we've been talking a lot about our COVID and CZU reimbursements that are $67 million in standing. Um, we This year, we've been hit by the uh, really three months of storms starting in January, going into February and March, two separate declared disaster events that have impacted our budget in, uh, considerably and impacted the departments presenting today within our sheriff coroner's response and community development public works response. Our behavioral health, our community has a lot of behavioral health needs and we are moving forward with making some great investments, both in services and facilities. And we have the challenge that's an opportunity to improve our public safety emergency communication systems that comes at a price tag that we still have not figured out how to fund. Um, our total budget is at 1.1 billion. Our general fund is 738.6 million. Uh, and we have about over 300 million easily in unfunded infrastructure projects across our aging infrastructure and facility. I won't spend a lot of time on this. We've talked about this a lot, but in, in last fall, in fall of 2022, we rebuilt and extended out our forecast model to move to a more credible model of forecast and 
forecasting deficits that factor in salary savings, factor in budget savings, uh, factor in known cost increases and new new revenue sources, and we're resulted with deficits, general fund deficits between eight and ten million dollars over the next four years. Our general fund reserves are at ten percent, and that's great. Unfortunately, that those reserves include about six percentage points of that for health uh, services investments in, to expand Medicare services. Um, so that's an area that we 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 are unable to move on some of those investments until we can increase our reserves to free up uh, those cash balances. Um, without those health reserves, our reserves will be at four percent or less than two payroll cycles. Within the general fund, um, as you might recall, on May 9th, although it's a seven hundred thirty eight million dollars budget, um, really two hundred and ten million is our general fund flexible revenue bases that we use to fund uh, operations across the county. And that 210 million in revenue supports 223 million in discretionary general fund uh, contributions to departments. So that's a nearly a $12.5 million gap. We're spending $12.5 million more in our revenue, but that's budget authority. So we expect there would be budget savings that would eliminate that $12.5 million uh, gap. The biggest investments are in our public safety and justice departments, 114 million followed by Health and Human General Government and debt is, is disclosed here. We'll conclude with the changes in our proposed budget uh, for the entire countywide budget, not just general fund, but countywide. Uh, the budget recommends adding 36.45 positions or a 1.3% increase. That's very um, modest. Um, and this is an austere budget and our departments worked um, well with, with our instructions that we released in the fall to have a very scaled back austere budget and to try to limit growth wherever possible in cost unfunded cost increases. Across the entire county, we're looking at 38.6 million in increases, and that sounds like a lot, but that's a 3.6% increase. This, this chart displays in orange the FTE changes. So the biggest increases in, in staffing are in health and human and land use and community development with six positions in public safety that we'll talk a little bit more in today's presentations. As a reminder, our budget hearings, we are approaching the end of the cycle. We're on our third budget hearing on May 31st. We'll continue the hearings to June 13th where the budget will be considered for approval. It will then be in our auditor controller's hands who will work over the summer with reconciling, uh, putting in the year-end numbers, and then submitting for the state controller the final adopted budget to this board on September 19th. As a brief overview, I'll be reviewing the public safety and justice uh, departments and land use and community services. Uh, in total, the public safety and justice departments are $202 million. The biggest amount goes to fund our, our sheriff corners department, probation, district attorney, and public defender. Of that $202 million, uh, $16 million is funded in other funds. So they're leaving $183 million for the general fund costs. Again, as breaking down that $114 million that you saw in the prior slide of how much the general fund supports our public safety and justice departments, $66 million to the sheriff coroner. Uh, they're not a revenue generating department, clearly. So we have uh, mandated services that we have to fund. And then public defender and district attorney, uh, followed by probation, are the top four with general fund contributions. The changes within these departments, um, the biggest changes are in our sheriff coroner and probation cost increases. 5.2 million in the sheriff corner and probation is 1.5, 1.6 million. Those are really reflective of the increase in cost for care of our, for those in our detention facilities, medical costs, mental health costs, food costs. There are some staff being added. Again, this is very historically low. Uh, three positions, sheriff corner, uh, two positions in public defender and one position in the district attorney. We're just not able to fund um, our services the way that even our departments um, made these strong cases for. Moving into an overview of our land use and community services department, there'll be th three more present or two uh, three presentations today: parks and open spaces, community development, which will be uh, planning, will cover planning, housing, and public works and infrastructure projects, and then we'll conclude with the capital projects, basically the county's facility projects, including parks. Uh, the consent agenda items are listed there and, and listed in the board packet that went out last week. Within the land use and community services department, it's a bigger budget, 301 million in total costs being allocated in this proposed 23-24 budget. But uh, about $9 out of every 10 is for other funds with 37 million left in the, in the general fund. So about 10% of that 301 million is in the general fund. 
263 million is other funds. The largest is our Department of Public Works Internal Service Fund at $226 million. Some of the general fund support of these departments, the biggest is for our parks, open spaces, and cultural services at 7 million. And our community development, um, the rest of the department title is, is truncated there, community development and, and infrastructure. That's really the planning support um, for that department, uh, just under 3 million for planning and the rest is a nominal amount for public works. The changes for land use and community services departments, the all, all the departments, the biggest change is an FTE change in, in the public works department, nine positions in public works. Given the entire size, it's a small level of positions that might look a lot in this chart, but that's a very small amount of position increases. And as you'll hear later today, several of them are, are, are opportunistic and very smart positions to be adding into our budget. Uh, Parks has three positions being added. Those are all thankfully uh, funded projects through state grants and local grants to help with trails and other projects. Uh, if you can see the blue bars are very small, uh, if not nothing, and cost increases in the rest of the departments. That concludes my overview. I, I really want to get you to the departmental presentations for the day. But if you have any questions, um, now would be a good time for any on the consent or anything I just covered. Thank you, Mr. Pimentel. Are there any questions before we open this opportunity up for the community to address us? All right, seeing none, we'd like to open it up for the community. It's an opportunity for uh, oral communications or comment on consent or on the regular agenda if you're unable to attend or a closed session as well or on any item not on today's agenda but within the purview of the board. Would anybody like to address us? Good morning. Welcome back. Good morning. Thank you. I would like to make a comment on item 20, proposed budget for the Superior Court. As you know, I'm interested in the prosecution of judicial child trafficking. I'd like to play something for you. That's what judicial child trafficking sounds like. More on this later. Morning. Welcome back. Good morning. My name is James Ewing Whitman. Uh, as far as the consent agenda, number 16, the Monterey Bay Bay Air. Um, you know, human beings can only live for about three minutes without quality air. You can live a couple days without water. And you can live like a month without food. So in reference to what I witnessed and heard yesterday, I wrote something down about what my public comments were in yesterday's proceedings. Welcome to examples of slaughterhouses where the John Perkins confessions of an economic hitman are the first steps of genocide, eugenics, techno-fascists, rock chisms, Fabian Shepherd socialism by the deceptions of puppets like this board of five men. All city and county council members have been under the complete control of unelected city and county managers, such as Carlos Palacios, since 1915, where deception seemed to be the status quo. My, my favorable comments and of, of a few others can be found on the Facebook, excuse me, can be found on the Facebook live link starting at 28 minutes, 30 seconds, in 65 minutes, 50 seconds. You know, when you are even in front of the sheriff's headquarters, there's a big, beautiful flag of the United States and of California. But inside every courtroom, including the sheriff's community room and in the um, city of Santa Cruz police office community room, there are the corporate pirate flags. So you guys are operating under several layers of parallel governments where our constitution, our original one, is really quite beautiful, as is our Declaration of Independence. But that was usurped and changed within the first 13 years of its inception. So there's a lot of things going on. And when when issues really come up, how are you folks going to really help Thank the public? You. Thank you. Is there anybody else in chambers? Good morning. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I want to again point out to you, as I did yesterday, that your website for all of this material accessible to the public is broken and has been broken since Saturday. There's no way for me or any other members of the public to review any of this material in advance from the meeting portal on the calendar as we usually do. 
So I, I really think it's a Brown Act violation for you to continue doing this because it has not been made available to the public. I want to speak to uh, County Fire Department budget. Why is that on the consent agenda? It is just as important to the public safety as is all of the law enforcement, public defender, all of those good people who spoke before you yesterday and will continue to speak before you today. Why is county fire on the consent agenda? And no one can even see the information because your website's broken. <laughs> because I go to the fire department advisory commission meetings regularly, I know what's in that contract with Cal Fire. It's been reduced to a one-year contract. When your board authorized and the levying of a new tax against CSA 48 property owners, we were told that it would fund three-year contracts, which happened in 2020. And now we're only getting a one-year contract with reductions in staffing that will um, harm plan reduction or plan review and also training. Why is this on the consent agenda? One of the things that uh, was presented at FDAC is a very gloomy report given by uh, Chief Armstrong and uh, that there isn't enough money to do what needs to be done. How can that be said when we've just been levied another very hefty tax? FDAC was very disturbed. And Supervisor Friend, your commissioner voiced his distrust with Cal Fire any longer because of the information that was given. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else in chambers that would like to address us on these items? Madam Clerk, is there anybody online? We have no speakers online, Chair. All right. We'll bring it back to the board for discussion and action on consent. Supervisor McPherson. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Friend. I, I wanted to address a couple issues. Item number 14, the library funds. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge um, all of the amazing facilities improvements that have been going on in our library system throughout Santa Cruz County. Uh, since the um, passage of Measure S in uh, June of 2016, uh, in particular, I'd like to mention that the Boulder Creek branch in my district opened a year ago this month, and the Scotts Valley branch uh, refurbishment uh, opened in August of last year. Uh, both these facilities have wonderful community resources and made possible because of the passage of Measure S. And I want to thank the voting public for doing that. Uh, it was uh, it, it was successful because it was countywide and everybody was involved. Every library uh, facility was uh, improved is is being improved or has been improved. And uh, it's a Felton Library. In fact, uh, was one of the was uh, completed a couple of years ago, and it has one of its kind in the nation of a discovery park right adjacent to it. Phenomenal facility. And uh, also I wanna say a special note, uh, I recently attended the uh, opening of the Branch, Branch 40 Branch Library in the city of Santa Cruz, and especially the Allison Indirect Memorial with Children's Room named after the wonderful board of uh, supervisor staff member who worked so hard in District 3 for so many years. Um, I want to, on LAPCO on number 15, uh, thank Joe Serino, our LAPCO director, for the tremendous amount of leadership he brings to that role. Uh, the job requires a lot of technical skills, and uh, he's been able to handle those, and there's going to be more action before LAPCO, I know, in the near future. Um, and then on 21, county fire, uh, I want to just thank our volunteer firefighters and the emergency medical uh, responders, as well as the staff who serve on our community uh, through a uh, contract with Cal Fire. Uh, they've made some decisions, some changes, um, but their service is invaluable and we know all too well in our county will continue to face high fire risks in the future. But uh, those are three of the things that I really wanted to mention in our consent agenda. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Any other colleagues have any comments on consent? All right, seeing none, um, excuse me, Supervisor, please. I'll see comments. You. Please do. So I'll move the uh, budget. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Cummings, a second from Supervisor McPherson. If we could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Friend? Aye. And that passes unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Pimentel, for your introduction and for the departments for their work. We'll move on to item five, which is to consider approval 
of the 22-23, excuse me, 2023-24 proposed budget for the district attorney public administrator, including any supplemental materials and take related actions as outlined in the reference budget documents and recommended by the CAO. Move the budget hearing item board memo, the proposed budget, the continuing agreements list, and the unified fee schedule. Coming today for us uh, for this item would be uh, District Attorney Jeff Rossell. We also have Eric Saab, the Chief of Administration for the District Attorney's Office. Good morning, uh, District Attorney Rossell. Welcome back. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Supervisor Friend, Chairman Friend, and the other supervisors. Are we ready to get started? Go ahead. Okay. Just want to make sure the, uh, the right, Aaron. All right, just want to make sure we're uh, technologically uh, on board. So I want to just start off by thanking uh, the board for the opportunity to be here uh, and the opportunity yet again uh, to come before you and to talk a little bit about what we've done, to talk about our budget and to thank you for your time and attention to, to public safety and to our office in particular. I'd also like to thank the staff of the DA's office. Um, we have the managers up here, uh, and that is incredible staff, people who work in all of our divisions, the criminal prosecution division, which we all sort of know about, but also the environmental and consumer protection division um, and victim witness assistants who provide assistance to victims uh, going through the criminal justice system. In fact, some of those that don't even have cases filed. I would also like to thank the CAO's office. I would like to thank Carlos Palacios, Nicole um, Coburn, Sven Stafford, and Marcus Pimental for all of their help and assistance in uh, preparing our budget and just frankly having an ongoing, honest dialogue about what we need to uh, make sure that public safety uh, is something that is a priority for this county. So as we go through uh, the budget presentation, um, I would like to start off talking about the guiding principles for the DA's office. And I would just like to remind uh, the board and uh, frankly, everybody that under the California constitution, public safety is the first responsibility of local government and that we have an obligation to adequately provide services for public safety. We in the DA's office are obligated to follow uh, various uh, authorities. Those include the United States Constitution, the California Constitution, California statutes, and the rules of professional conduct. We also have a duty to protect victims, the rights of defendants, which surprises some people, to review and file cases and to investigate them and to seek justice and to act ethically. We specifically in the DA's office of Santa Cruz County have a mission statement and our mission statement is to promote and ensure public safety through ethical and just prosecution. One of the things that I think is important to focus on is that we in the DA's office are not a rubber stamp for law enforcement that make arrests and refer cases to the DA's office. As you can tell from this slide, uh, these numerous agencies, some that are at the forefront of our mind and others that may not be, are all of the law enforcement agencies in the County of Santa Cruz that refer cases to the DA's office. Those cases we have an obligation, as I stated earlier, to thoroughly investigate, to make determinations about whether charges are appropriate and whether or not to file charges. Um, and when it comes to uh, filing charges, we are spending a tremendous amount of time going through the evidence that comes to us. I used to say it was reports in the old days. Now it's body cam video. It is forensic digital analysis on phones, computers, and all sorts of things. So to say that our job has become uh, much more difficult in terms of uh, making filing decisions based on the incredible amount of information we get, I think is frankly uh, a huge understatement. So uh, I also want to say that when it comes to primary budget goals, uh, we have identified three. Uh, and the first one is to improve communication, education, and transparency to the community, which we have strived 
uh, as an office, and frankly, I understand as a county, we have strived to achieve these th same sort of goals. The second is to enhance outreach, prevention, and early intervention practices, which we have done. I can tell you that in South County, we sponsored or major participants with probation and other volunteer groups, uh, Trunk or Treat, we served over 4,000 people. We did an adopt a family, which served 900 children, 160 families. We have participated in National Night Out, Teen Academy, and a whole bunch of things that we believe on the front end will help and prevent sort of uh, people that end up criminal justice involved. We're also focusing, we can talk a little bit about it later on truancy because there's an enormous link between um, children that are truant and children that become system involved later on. The third goal is to augment resources to assist with digital technology, forensic evidence collection and analysis. And as I mentioned, uh, with the advent of body camera, digital media, forensic media, social media, um, in order to properly review a case to determine whether you want to file it and to determine uh, whether a case should be filed and to actually prosecute it, uh, it requires tremendous, tremendous efforts and energy in terms of forensics. This is also forensics that include getting reports from the, all the various law enforcement agencies that I showed you so that we can properly make decisions, provide that when we file and push that out to public defenders, to private attorneys, uh, and to those sort of things. So when it comes to the proposed budget, uh, the positions that we have, as you can see, are 109 um, full-time positions right now. When we talk about changes uh, from the adopted budget, there was one program coordinator position that came midterm uh, already, and that was funded by some financial sources. So there were no net county costs for that position. And we are getting refunded uh, an attorney position that we have, but which was previously unfunded. So the general fund contribution uh, is 17.1 million, as you can see from the slide and your own information. And the increase in general fund contribution this year is 905,000. The bulk of that is negotiated and agreed upon salary and benefit increases. So with respect to the operational plan uh, in one of our divisions, the criminal prosecution division, as I've said, school truancy is something that we want to focus on. Uh, we believe that uh, there is a significant issue here that we can sort of drive the train in addressing that we can do community uh, outreach. We are Extremely proud of our neighborhood courts program, which was spearheaded by the DA's office, frankly, the fourth one in the state of California out of all 58 counties. It has literally kept at least 150 people out of the criminal justice system by referring them to neighborhood courts. This is a program that we run uh, with the Community Resource Center. Uh, and we also do media outreach, which I know some of you as supervisors have had the environmental unit come in and, and speak to some of your constituents, some of them more vulnerable people. Scams are constantly evolving and those things need to be sort of uh, pushed out to the community so that we can prevent people from becoming victims. Um, we want a county forensic team that we are working on. We are currently in the process with some of the other agencies uh, besides the sheriff's office of uh, literally ripping phones, getting information off of digital media so that we can provide uh, relevant and proper information for filing decisions and also uh, proper information to help them, uh, these agencies assist in investigating cases. We are currently also exploring artificial intelligence for transcription. And as you might be aware in our business, transcription of all the digital media interviews and everything else is a huge uh, time and money um, sort of resource uh, input, the resource implied. And uh, the bottom line is we are working with some sort of artificial intelligence. We're experimenting with different ones to try to see if there are more efficient ways that we can leverage technology. 
With respect to the victim advocate section, we are improving survivor services. Those are the cases that are filed. Those are cases that are not filed, still providing services. And as I've said, in consumer protection with white collar, we've done a tremendous amount of outreach uh, in your jurisdictions and are frankly always available uh, for that. With respect to staffing and systems, as I spoke about earlier, there is a refunding of a full-time attorney to mitigate the backlog of cases and to ensure public safety. We are finalizing a new case management system, CARPEL, which is uh, proved very beneficial in terms of the information and data that we can get for transparency issues, but um, it, it has been, there have been some challenges in implementing that for sure. And then uh, in terms of state budget considerations, I know there were some questions about whether the government, the governor's revised budget had any implications. Um, it did not. And so with that, we are happy to uh, address any concerns or listen to any comments that the board may have about our proposed budget. And we would just ask you to adopt it. Thank you, Mr. Rizal. Are there any questions or comments from board members? Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, thank you. Um, I want to thank you, uh, District Attorney Jeff Rosell, and your whole team for all their hard work and make our community safer in the partnership with the P Public Defender's Office. Of course, that's a new county administrative office. And I know that you've, uh, the cooperative effort that you've exhibited along with our public defender who addressed us yesterday is really, really encouraging. And I really thank you. I think I know she does too, our public defender. And um, I'm I'm glad that uh, we're able to add this additional position uh, to address the, the backlog of cases that you have. And I especially want, as you mentioned, to uh, compliment you again on the neighborhood courts, uh, the fourth one in the state of California, and how, imp uh, how impactful it's been uh, for making our community safer. Um, you know, it's it's critical that the cases be resolved as quickly and justly as possible, as you have stated and you have done. And I want to thank your staff for the uh, the work to support the victims of crime too, uh, as well as um, the efforts to prevent crime. Uh, very much uh, at the top of the list and ahead of most every other county in the state of California. So congratulations on that. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Supervisor Cummings. Thank you for that presentation. Um, thank you. I know that one of the things that you'd mentioned was that a lot of the increases are around um, salaries. And I'm just curious um, what the vacancy rates are like and retentions like currently. So, yeah, we have done all right. Uh, we still have uh, positions that need to be filled. We have at least one position that needs to be filled too now with the, with the advent of that. So when I became district attorney, one of the things that I tried to do was stem the tide of attorneys that were leaving to go over the hill. As we know, Santa Clara out of 58 counties is the highest paid DA's office in the state, significantly higher than Santa Cruz County. So what we tried to do was we'll never catch them, but we tried to sort of close the gap between Santa Cruz County and Santa Clara such that uh, people would at least think twice before we lost them to Santa Clara and other jurisdictions. So I will say we've done okay. Um, these salaries and benefits that were received by uh, the attorneys in the office and, and other staff, I do think all of them justified because as soon as you have experience that walks out the door, it takes years to try to catch up to where we were. We do offer things in, in the office, I think, that other offices don't. We've had people who, frankly, have gotten offers from Santa Clara that turned it down for literally tens and tens of thousands of dollars. And that is because we offer things that they don't. We offer a family atmosphere, community atmosphere. Uh, we take an interest in everybody. We're, we're not so big that uh, anybody is above uh, sitting and talking about cases and strategies and those sort of things. So... Um, we've done okay, uh, but we feel as an office, those salaries and benefits were absolutely crucial and important to keeping people in our county so that we don't drain the, the incredible experience resources that we have. Appreciate all your efforts to try to keep people in the community and keep that um, collaborative atmosphere within your office. Um, the one, I guess one comment is that um, as someone who's, pretty passionate about tenant protections, just wanting to hopefully engage in more conversation around that. Um, as I've been talking to folks in the community, there's a lot of scams that have been popping up around rental housing online where people will, yeah. you know, fill out this application, pay this fee, 
and then the person kind of disappears and those are becoming more frequent. I know students, especially UCSC, are targeted as um, as as victims of those kinds of services. And um, and then just, you know, we've been hearing about um, other um, forms of exorbitant rent increases and what have you. And oftentimes, as I mentioned yesterday, the board that oftentimes falls on the individual. But, you know, given the fact that the DA's office deals with consumer protections and housing is something that we're, you know, a lot of tenants are paying into to the extent we can figure out how we can deter that kind of predatory behavior. I think it would be great to see what um, what role the DA's office could play in that as well. I appreciate that. And I can tell you with respect to the rental scams, um, we are prosecuting several cases right now. Uh, and those are near and dear to our heart. They are consumer protection uh, cases. And we're trying to do outreach as well on the front end so people don't become victims. But when the cases uh, are there, we are happy to prosecute those. Uh, the rent increases is a little bit of a different uh, uh, issue. There are some things that we have power to control, scams, crimes. Uh, there are others that are frankly a little bit more difficult, but we are certainly happy to engage in that. And uh, if you would have uh, any place that you would like us to educate people or do one of our consumer protection presentations to try to avoid those scams, we are absolutely happy to do that. And thank, thank you for you. your comments. Thank you. And I, and I can vouch for those trainings. Uh, we've held a couple of them in our district and they've been very, very good. I appreciate your team's work on that. You know, a question was raised yesterday in regards to uh, parity. Sometimes the three legal offices kind of get lumped together, even though they do really distinct work, you, County Council, and uh, the Public Defender's Office. Uh, when I had, had worked uh, for a local law enforcement agency, you know, we had a different standard of probable cause than you do for a prosecution of beyond a reasonable doubt. So can you just maybe do you, I don't know if you have these numbers handy, but do you have a sense of how many cases you had begun by showing all the referral agencies that come in, but do you have a sense of how many cases come to you that then you don't file and therefore some of these other entities like the public defender might not be involved in the same way? Yeah, I, that's a fantastic question. I appreciate you asking. I will say this, we get about 10,000 referrals to our DA's office a year of criminal cases from all sorts of sources that I showed on the slide. And we are not a rubber stamp. Uh, and anybody who thinks that does not understand how the DA's office works. So out of those 10,000 cases, we are responsible for literally conducting independent investigations on those, making determinations about A, whether a crime was committed, B, whether you have the right person, and C, whether you can file charges. And then there's the, should it go to neighborhood courts? Should it, how should it get resolved? Uh, and I can tell you, we file probably about 50% of those cases. So the cases that wind up in court uh, are a minority or about half of the cases that get referred to us. Of those cases that wind up in court, some of those are referred to private attorneys, depending upon the case. Environmental consumer protection are typically uh, private attorneys. You have conflict firms, uh, you have criminal cases with private attorneys. And so uh, we also, in the Consumer Environmental Protection Division, sometimes file civil suits. And if you file a civil suit, uh, those are almost exclusively handled by civil attorneys, corporate attorneys, and those sort of things. And sometimes in the consumer environmental protection world, you don't even need to file a suit. They'll engage in discovery and give notice. And there's a lot of those cases that, uh, frankly, don't even necessarily get filed and see the inside of a courtroom. So. I appreciate that. I mean, that's why I think that it's important to look at each of these budgets independently. I mean, for some reason, they tend to be looked at and grouped as just some sort of general need, but I think that they, it makes sense to continue looking. Yeah, at I them. think there is a, a tendency, maybe somebody thinks, oh, well, the public defenders, for example, is the, should be the same as the DA's office. And the answer is uh, we, we review uh, thousands upon tens of thousands of cases that never make the inside of a courtroom um, that we are responsible for. We file uh, thousands of cases in consumer environmental protection that frankly don't go into the public defender's hands. And we file numerous cases, uh, hundreds and hundreds that uh, go to private attorneys or conflict firms. So thank you for that question. Yeah. Are there any other questions before we open it up for the community? You know, I'd just like to make one point. I was attended the Senior Legal Services annual event uh, recently, and uh, I want to just say in your Consumer Affairs uh, office, uh, Doug Allen has done a phenomenal job. And just to give a warning to the senior citizens, I mean, the stories that people are losing tens of thousands of dollars 
and just don't believe it if you hear it on the phone and your daughter or cousin in Alabama is being held and needs to get out of jail or something. The stories that I hear and the people that get into those things is phenomenal. It's sad, but uh, I just um, want to thank you for that aspect of your office and what you do. And just to warn people, just don't take the bait. Yeah, it, it's it is uh, it's heartbreaking when you hear stories about people who have literally lost everything they have on various evolving scams, uh, and they are constantly evolving. Uh, as soon as people get a handle on one thing, the next thing pops up. So, as I said, as an office, we are always happy to do uh, front end work, and if you can think of places that you would like us to go, please let us know. We're always happy to do that. And I want to thank you for your comments, all of you. Thank you. I will right, we'll open it up for the community. It's an opportunity for members of the community to address us on the district attorney's budget. Anybody in chambers, please. Thank you, um, Mr. Rizal, for that report. I, um, I really want to commend your staff member, Mr. Ed Brown, for doing the environmental work and prosecution of the Barry Swenson builders for their illegal um, removal of a a tank of who knows what it was. They took it out in the middle of the night in Aptos Village. It was the only slap on the hand they got. So thank you. That was really wonderful work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I also, however, really think you missed an opportunity to do some restorative justice with prosecuting the two young men who left the black sine wave of skid marks on the Black Lives Matter mural in downtown Santa Cruz. I think that was a prime opportunity to work out something like a neighborhood court rather than putting them, prosecuting them and putting them behind bars. The, the mural itself is now degraded and those young men are still probably really angry and we missed a real opportunity there. So I hope you will rethink that kind of prosecution in the future. I also have learned recently that human trafficking is a big problem in our county. Uh, tremendous and, and very uh, shocking. And I understand from uh, leaders of the Aruka Project that your staff and the law enforcement are very, very focused on trying to um, Get behind that and 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 prosecute. It's very difficult because of social media, because these predators are on the move, and that leads into this predatory action on the internet. It is it is shocking, Supervisor McPherson. You heard at the senior legal how it works with um, financial scams, but there are scams luring young people, well, actually people of all ages, all sexes, into the human trafficking market, and Santa Cruz County is a hotbed of it. So um, thank you for for continuing to monitor that and doing what you can. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else in chambers that would like to address us on this budget? Good morning, um, DA Rosal. Your report sounded so um, compassionate and helpful. However, I've experienced the complete opposite of everything you said. There have been forty. 40 million views of children kidnapped here in Santa Cruz County. And your office hung up on my victim advocate 15 times. And when we came down to present our evidence and our case of all the wrongdoing that happened in my child's violent kidnapping and how I was violently assaulted by her father, we were ignored. We were pawned off, told to give it to Santa Cruz Police Department. They have not done justice. I'm really unhappy with the independent auditor, Mr. Janako. The whole world is watching Santa Cruz. There is an opportunity to right some terrible wrongs. And I am asking you to take this budget and all this money and all this forensic science stuff that you of are alleging that you have access to. I am a forensic scientist. I've put the whole case together. I've done all the work. And regarding to the transparency of the body cam footage, that is for the public to view. And yet the Santa Cruz Police Department is refusing to provide it. It is of great public interest that overrides any excuse that they are trying to give from withholding that. 
I really would like to see you, since the whole world is watching, to be an American hero, to work with Sheriff Jim Hart, who is standing on a precipice to make changes here in Santa Cruz County. We are known as the court kidnapping, child trafficking capital of the world, much like my childhood when we were the murder capital of the world. Let's solve the problem together. I want to work with both of you. I am available. I have put the case together. Please, let's let's have you guys, you gentlemen, be the heroes we need. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak about the budget item in front of us here at the district attorney's office? Good morning. Well, yeah, my name is James Ewing Whitman. Um, I find the legal system in Santa Cruz to be quite interesting and quite baffling. I deliberately put myself through a case system last year that was very minor, I suppose. But I think it's quite interesting when you provide evidence where the California Coastal Commission in 1975 has clearly said that any individual has 24-hour access to the beaches and waterways. And you provide that information. The magistrate that was um, presiding over that case, and it was just her and myself and the deputies there, I was still found guilty. You know, it's interesting, another case that went through this county involving Mr. Michael Manningly doing the same thing. He actually had a jury trial. Now I'm going to read something from the juror's handbook. There's a picture of it. Um, as a juror in a trial setting, when it comes to your individual vote of innocent or guilty, you are truly only answerable, answerable to God Almighty. The First Amendment to the Constitution was born out of this great concept. However, judges today refuse to inform jurors of their rights. So I don't know. I think that there's so much room for positive growth. I'm glad that I'm here to witness others suggesting working together with you folks. So thank you. Thank you. Anybody else in chambers like to address us on the district attorney's budget? All right, seeing none, we'll close the chamber's comment. Is there anybody online, Madam Clerk? We have no online speakers for this item, Chair. Okay, we'll bring it back to the board for action. I believe Supervisor Cummings had a comment. I did have a, a comment on the um, the defacing of the Black Lives Matter. You know, I actually did want to thank your office for um, how they engaged with the community that had been negatively impacted by that. Um, I know that it was um, mentioned in the comments that the guys behind jail, those individuals actually never saw any jail time, just so that's clear, and have been involved in a restorative justice process where they're going to be meeting with the communities that's been impacted and having community dialogues. And so this is an example of, you know, a different approach of addressing um, how people are treated within the criminal justice system. And the, just so folks are aware, the Black Lives Matter mural in downtown Santa Cruz actually is going to be getting repainted on June 24th. And there is some discussion about those individuals actually helping with that repainting effort. And so it really is a different approach to trying to have more of a restorative justice approach on um, the criminal justice system. And I think that just goes to show that the leadership here in Santa Cruz through your office, uh, Mr. Rosell is really trying to take a different approach at how we're addressing criminal justice in Santa Cruz County. So I just wanted to thank you um, for all the work that your office has done on that. Thank you for your kind words, Supervisor Cummings. And with that, I'm happy to move the um, budget for the DA's office. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Cummings, a second from Supervisor Hernandez. No additional comments. Then if we could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. And friend. Aye. And that passes unanimously. Thank you for your work, Mr. Rosell, and your Thank entire team. Thank you for your time. We'll move on to item six, which is to consider approval of the 23-24 proposed budget for the sheriff coroner, including any supplemental materials and take related actions as outlined in the reference budget documents and recommended by the CAO. We have the budget hearing item board memo, the proposed budget and line item detail, the fixed assets and the continuing agreements list. And with us today, we have the sheriff uh, coroner Jim Hart with Under Sheriff Chris Clark, and we also have Kathy Sands when the budget questions get asked. Welcome back to all you all, uh, Sheriff Hart. Thank you, Supervisor. Good morning, Board Jim Hart, Sheriff Corner, and thanks, Zach, for the introductions. I might not have remembered all those names, so I appreciate that. Uh, my law, my law enforcement chief, Jake Ainsworth, had to leave for uh, an emergency that's popped up, so. Uh, he was going to be available for any law enforcement questions, but we can handle that. Uh, this is my ninth budget as your sheriff. And uh, even though I recognize and acknowledge that we uh, use a lot of money uh, out of the general fund, that this is a very lean budget in terms of 
Uh, we're not adding uh, many personnel. We're adding two records clerks to the jail to help process people in and out rather than have correctional officers do that work. And then we've, we've, we're really in the process of beefing up our mental health and medical services uh, on the front end at the jail as well. And that's, but that's where you're going to see the increases in this, in this budget. I do want to acknowledge and thank Rita Sanchez and, and Melody Serrano from the County Administrative Office for helping us uh, work through this budget as well as CEO Carlos Palacios. So moving on to our mission statement, this hasn't changed from last year and we believe in this. And uh, really at the end of the day, our job is to help make things better. We're not gonna solve all the social ills around homelessness and addiction and mental illness, but uh, our staff can be out there, be available and try to help make things better. Uh, in terms of our services, where, where does that $61 million in, in net county cost go? And uh, we're broken up into three bureaus, but primarily the money spent in two bureaus in our in our operations bureau, which is our law enforcement branch and our corrections bureau. And you can see the different functions that we serve. And I just want to remind the community and the board that that we don't work a standard forty hour work week. Uh, we We have a, a twenty four hour a day, seven day a week, one hundred and sixty eight hours every week that we're staffing. And so if, if one, one position, say our Felton deputy, it takes six, six people to cover that one position. And so, yes, we're expensive, but we're also uh, putting in a lot more hours uh, uh, than a standard work week for a lot of our positions. Um, our Corrections Bureau, uh, it, it runs about roughly $35 million or so. Um, we, we just reopened Blaine street, as you might have heard, I was real glad that we did that. We have 25 women at Blaine street today, and, uh, we're staffing that on overtime right now. Uh, and then we have our main jail and then two of the three units at round tree are open. We still have one unit down there closed because of staffing issues. And then I just want to touch on court security that we, we provide judicial protection in the courts, both in Watsonville and in Santa Cruz. And we have 22, roughly uh, 22 positions that do that work. Today, our uh, main jail population is 267, which is about 100 uh, less than pre-COVID numbers. Uh, Blaine Street, 25, and Roundtree, we have 70 men down at Roundtree. And then moving on, I just I, I do this every year, but I just want to give you an idea of, of the effectiveness of the sheriff's office and the way that we work with the community and, and just give you an idea of, of what, what is it that we're getting for this money that we're spending. And so in this chart, you can see in the red, the state average for violent crimes per 1,000 state residents is about 4.7 violent crimes for every 1,000 residents in California. In unincorporated Santa Cruz County, it's a third. It's at 1.5, 1.6. And then you uh, move over to uh, property crimes. And again, it's about a third of the state average. And then our overall crime rate is remarkably low. I've never seen it this low. It's at about nine crimes per 1,000 county residents compared to a state average of about 27. You can see this is a, about a 12 year uh, graph showing crime trends. And there's two markers in here. And one is prison realignment and the other is Prop 47. And there's been a lot of discussion about both of those pieces of legislation. One that was uh, prison realignment was passed by the legislature, whereas Prop 47 was voted, uh, voted in to law. And pre, pre prison realignment, we were, we were as a county, at about 27 crimes per 1,000 residents. And nobody was sure statewide what prison realignment was gonna do uh, to the crime rate. And really what it did is it impacted the jail systems, the county jail systems, and it impacted the probation department because uh, we became sort of a quasi state prison and the probation department became sort of a parole office as well. Uh, and thankfully, since prison realignment hit, you can see the crime rate trended down. It flattened out for about five years. And then after Prop 47, uh, it, it, it's gone down dramatically. And so our crime rate is, again, about a third of what it was before those two pieces of legislation took effect. I want to talk a little bit about homicides. Obviously, this is there's a lot of terrible crimes out here, but this the homicides have a reverberating effect throughout communities. 
And I hear a lot of people talk about, uh, we wish we were in Santa Cruz in the good old days. I grew up here. I hear people say in the 70s and 80s where our, we could let our kids run around in the street and there was no crime. But there was actually multiple serial killers working in Santa Cruz County in the 70s and early 80s. And you could see in the mid 80s, there, there was a lot of killing going on in unincorporated Santa Cruz County. In a two-year period, we had 25 murders. And then you, you look at that graph going down. And for the last 10 years in Santa Cruz, unincorporated, this isn't including the four city jurisdictions, but we've had uh, 19 murders in the last 10 years, less than two a year. Now, any murder is unacceptable, but this, these numbers are, are dropping and have continued to drop dramatically. And, this, and looking at the uh, graph in terms of five-year increments, you could see 88 to 92, a violent time in Santa Cruz County, 32 homicides. That's a lot of killing that went on. And then look at 2013 to 17, two homicides in a five-year period. And then uh, we've spiked back up a little bit to about the uh, the 30-year average of 17 over five five years. And I'll have Kathy talk to you about the, the budget. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Um, we've really, as the sheriff has said, we put in a really lean budget working really well with the CAO's office to make sure that all the needs for the community and our office are met. We are increasing our um, funded positions by three. We're refunding two records clerks, as the sheriff had mentioned, and we're adding one information technology business systems analyst, which is completely cost recovered by the local agencies for our CLUTS administration that's required by law. And then we also have an increase in our uh, expenditures primarily to negotiated salary increases and in benefits and our corrections facility for medical, mental health, and our food costs that are continually rising. Um, our revenue, we've been able to stay status quo. As you're, I'm sure, all aware, we are a non-generating revenue um, office, and so we really depend on the general fund and all of our grants and those type of items to keep us functioning. And we've been able to hold that steady this year. Okay, and then just uh, briefly moving on to capital or system requests. Uh, we are in the process of the early stages of building our DNA lab, which uh, you have been informed about several times now over the last year or so. And construction is gonna start soon on that. And then after construction, DNA accreditation, uh, we've mentioned the increased medical and mental health. We're also in the process of bringing our jail system up to national accreditation standards. We're working through the new Cal AIM legislation. I'll talk about that in a, mo a moment. And then we have a very uh, costly main jail control panel electronics uh, project that's going in right now. Uh, there's workers in the jail putting this in, fixing a, a lot of, of old technology that, that is now being replaced. And as far as future potential projects, uh, we do have space out at our headquarters building for a gun range that was planned when that that, that uh, office was constructed. Um, we have the plans drawn, but uh, we're a little bit shy on the revenue. So we're, just, we're holding that as a future project. And then my office, Chris, Kathy, myself have been working with the county administrator and his staff on the early stages of trying to, to identify site location, as well as funding for a new jail. If you read the, the most recent grand jury report, uh, the grand juries in their report is calling for a new jail. This is something I've been talking about now for the last nine years. That that's just an aged facility that needs replacement and it doesn't meet modern standards. Moving on to our 23 to 25 operational plan update. Uh, the, the, the increased medical and mental health is going to be we're doing they're going to be doing screening for mental health on the front end right now correctional officers do do some screening for mental health services but we're actually going to have a clinician 24 hours a day doing uh, intake screening prior to accepting an incarcerated person into our system i mentioned the jail control panel the recovery center after construction we're hoping that it's going to open up around january 1st of 25 and we anticipate diverting somewhere between 400 and 500 people a month from jail into the recovery center. It'll be run by a, a private vendor uh, who's in the treatment and substance abuse uh, business. 
And we're hoping that people who come in for first time DUIs, people who are too intoxicated to care for themselves, pe people who are under an influence of drugs, rather than go to jail, they will be diverted into the recovery center. Their cases will still go through the district attorney's office for, for prosecution review. But the hope is that we can get these people in, uh, to meet with clinicians at the recovery center and help focus them into some sort of treatment, treat, in some sort of treatment services. And then uh, you've been in, you've been informed about the DNA laboratory. Uh, talking about Cal AIM, I'm, I, I know that you guys have all heard a little bit about this. We're still trying uh, to to work out the, uh, everything that we have to do in terms of what what this what this piece of legislation is going to do. But what 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 how we see it is that Cal AIM is going to provide increased uh, treatment. And then also uh, uh, a warm handoff, better services as somebody's leaving our jail facility uh, so that they're just not being released to the community without any support services. And then it's, we're also going to have staff that is going to enroll people into Medi-Cal uh, about 90 days prior to their scheduled release so that when they leave our facility, they'll have access to services on the day that they leave. And then Kathy touched on the increased food costs. Uh, I, I, I do want to touch on the difficulty recruiting. T to me, this is uh, probably the most significant issue that law enforcement is facing today, not just in this county and state, but across the country. And uh, we're, we're, we're sitting right now on, we have 14 vacancies and corrections. We have seven on the deputy side. We have uh, six positions of the deputies that were unfunded a number of years ago. We have 25 people in training. So we have about 50 positions that aren't productive right now. And we're, we're getting by okay on the law enforcement side, but we're running our corrections bureau on overtime because we don't have enough staff. And, and we've worked with the personnel department. We've tried bonuses, job fairs. We've lowered some standards in certain areas. We've civilianized as many positions as possible to, to pull the uniform personnel out of those assignments and get them either on the street or on the floor in the jail. And we're continuing to, to look at our office in terms of what can we, what jobs do we have where a deputy or a correctional officers are performing those duties, but we could bring a non-sworn person in to do that work and, and get the correctional officers and deputies back, back to a, a more uh, a typical assignment. And so we've identified seven or eight positions that, that moving forward, we're gonna, we're gonna work with the CAO on civilianizing those positions. But when we, we've been running our jail system now for the last four or five years on overtime and our staff is tired and they, they look to other agencies and primarily so that they don't have to work 60 or 70 hours a week, they could work 40 or 50 hours a week. And, and so it's, it's just a, it's a real critical issue in law enforcement right now. And it's something that, that we have to continue to, to, to think of ways of not only hiring and recruiting people, but retaining them. And the district attorney touched on the fact that we don't want to be an agency that hires and trains and gives people experience. And then they, in two or three years, they go to Santa Clara. Because every time somebody, particularly on the deputy side, walks out the door, either retirement injury or going to another agency, it takes about 18 months to get that position hired and trained and then, uh, and then put back on the street. And so we're, we're, we'll be continuing to work with the CAO and personnel on, on some ideas on how we can do this, but we, but we really need to value our, our County employees. And I, and I, I think they, they do feel valued. But if, if they can go over to Santa Clara County and make 25, in some cases, 40% more at a couple of those agencies over there, uh, that, that's where they're going to go. And, and so we just have to really work on that. And then the last thing I want to touch on are there are some projects that are centered around equity and, and diversion and intervention services, and those include the DNA lab. Most, most DNA work is done on homicide cases and sexual assault, and survivors and victims of those crimes particularly around sexual assault or primarily women and children and statistically uh, on, on homicide people of color. And so I think the DNA lab is going to service uh, uh, and, and uh, the, everybody more equitably and then increased medical and mental health care in, in the jail facilities uh, as well as the recovery and the Cal AIM program. I think all of those programs really address this issue here. 
So that, that's the presentation and our request is to approve the 23-24 proposed budget for the Sheriff Corner's office, including any supplemental materials as provided in the reference budget documents. Thank you. Thank you, Sheriff Hart. Are there questions or comments from board members before we open it up for the community? Uh, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, thank you, uh, Sheriff Hart and uh, everyone in the department who has done so much uh, to work tirelessly to keep our community safe. Uh, like our uh, other safety and justice agency, I, pre I appreciate your department's coordinated effort uh, with our local police and district attorney and public defender's office, as you mentioned, uh, um, you know, we're uh, coordinated a, uh, a, you know, an effort with the police agencies under the oversight of uh, our board chair, Zach Friend, and uh, one that hasn't been done very often in, throughout the state. And uh, it's not unlike what we did in the community placing policing efforts uh, more than 10 years ago to uh, really, uh, really put that in place. And, uh, and you're continuing it. It really helps. I think it gives our, our community more confidence in what you're doing. Um, the, I think the, uh, you, you are our largest general fund investment, but it's, it's needed. And uh, uh, it, I think that uh, it's really impressive that uh, you're increasing your efforts to address the those uh, who are taken into custody that need uh, mental health assistance. Um, it's a huge step forward. It's one that everybody has their minds on at this point uh, with what's going on in the state and in this world. Uh, and we know our uh, sheriffs, your correction officers, and uh, you encumber a lot of challenges every every day, every year. And I just want to say how much I appreciate every one of the, your officers that are in the department for hanging in there. And uh, it's not a real fun time to be in law enforcement uh, in some respects, but uh, you're appreciated by me. And I know many, many others, most others, uh, of what you're doing and to keep our community safe. Um, and from an administrative perspective, like other departments, we recognize, you know, it's difficult to keep up with uh, uh, the state and federal programs and the mandates you're having. And uh, I think you're, you're doing as well as you can. And I hope that you can fill those vacancies as quickly as possible. I, I really um, want to preach, say how much I appreciate sustaining the sheriff's uh, service centers that are embodied, uh, embedded in our communities. Uh, the uh, the offices in San Lorenzo Valley, in particular, in my district, up in Boulder Creek and Felton, uh, people just feel better. They feel safer, and they are safer, as you uh, said in some of your the statistics that you had. Uh, again, I want to say how much I appreciate the opening of the Blaine Street. We had some discussion on that about a month or two ago. Um, but what you're doing under some very trying circumstances is much appreciated by by this board of supervisors, by this this supervisor at least, for sure, and I'm sure the others and the community for what you're doing. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson, Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Sheriff uh, and Under Sheriff for everything that you do. Um, great that we've reopened Blaine Street. Of course, not great that it's been done with overtime, but glad we found a way uh, to make that facility available. Um, you know, you, you mentioned moving correctional officer roles to civilians wherever possible and just made me think about, you know, opportunities for efficiency within the, uh, within the division. You'd mentioned uh, in, in our past conversations how um, actually that, that work we do with court security can take up a significant amount of time. I mean, it's 22 positions, non-trivial, right? Um, and just getting people to their arraignments from the jail over to the courthouse and back uh, can take up a significant amount of time. Is there any progress towards virtual arraignments or going, you know, I know we had those during uh, COVID, so any movement towards allowing those again? Is there any work that we can do on the legislative side, working with our state representatives to make that possible again? Yeah, Chief Freight has, has done some work on that. And Dan, do you mind coming up and just briefly addressing that? Morning. Uh, we do continue to do that. Usually, only if somebody is uh, has COVID or is infected. Uh, it really, it's working with the courts um, under certain circumstances. If an inmate is uh, very problematic, sometimes, or there's some kind, of, some kind of safety issue with transportation, sometimes we will do that video arraignment. Um, we have the technology to do it, and really, it's it's more in the court's hands. Uh, a lot of the attorneys prefer to see their clients in person uh, while they're representing them in the court. And then there's certain, uh, my understanding is there's certain types of court cases that allow virtual appearances and there's certain that require an in-person appearance. 
Okay, so there, there's some things that are just sort of the preference of the court or the attorneys, uh, and there's a, a, just a few cases where it's an actual requirement to have an in-person arraignment. Yes, my understanding is like a, a, a forgive me, I'm trying to recall <laughs> the name of it. Uh, obviously, a jury trial will require that, and then um, uh, a preliminary hearing requires an in-person appearance as well as a few others uh sometimes an inmate can waive their appearance and be represented by the uh, their attorney without them being there uh but generally the courts locally at least have preferred to have their most of the inmates in, in person they feel like it, it helps resolve cases sometimes quicker than it would if if they were to just do a video arraignment okay good enough I'm Maybe worth a further conversation with the court. I'm happy to, to assist with that since I know it is a big drain on resources. Um, the other question was regarding Prop 47. Um, I mean, the graph showed a 50% decrease in crime since the passage of that. Um, do you think that's just because those are no longer, I mean, I don't know if that, those were just felonies um, or, I mean, so is that just because we're not counting as many things as crimes or as felonies, or is it because there's actually been a, a change in the environment? Yeah, so both the, the crime rate that you saw on the, on the statistics are include both misdemeanors and felonies. So it really has nothing to do with uh, crime was reduced from a felony to a misdemeanor. It's a, uh, it's a trend that we're seeing across the state in terms of, of reduced crime. There's pockets of increased crime, particularly in bigger cities. Um, it's, it's great technology. The, 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 the cameras everywhere where I think have a deterrent effect on, on some of the behavior. Uh, I, th I think it goes all the way to housing too, in terms of uh, our our county is so expensive to live in, and so many homes that may uh, that that uh, have been rehabbed, and and people are are moving here and working in the Silicon Valley or working remotely. So there's a lot of theories out there in terms of why crime is going down. I I say it's great police work, um, but it's probably a variety of reasons. Okay, thank you, Supervisor Cummings. Just want to thank you for that presentation and update and it'd be great if you could share those slides with us because i think it's helpful for us when we're engaging with the community to your point where people say that you know things are out of control and crime is up and being able to really show them that you know statistically that's actually not the case and that we're actually seeing less crime now than we did previously um, i think it'd be helpful just for us to be able to share that with the public when we're when we're encountered with those kinds of comments um I'd also share the appreciation of reopening Blaine Street. I know that it's going to be a challenge with the overtime and, um, you know, to the extent that we can help get messaging out around, you know, what positions are available and, and help you all out. I think that it will help the community also understand that if we want these programs to exist and we want these alternatives, then we need people to actually be in those positions. And I think oftentimes um, people lose sight of that, that, you know, it is expensive to live here and it's challenging. And if we want all these good things that are, you know, maybe a shift from what the criminal justice was system was previously, we need the people to be in those positions to run those programs. And so I'm happy to help with any kind of messaging around that as it relates to you all expanding your services. Um, and then to the point about the main jail, um, I have a number of um, friends who've been in the leadership Santa Cruz and they were able to take the tour and I'd like to go on the tour still at some point now that the rains are behind us. But, um, you know, even people who may not be um, on, they may have the sentiments around, you know, not incarcerating people, not being, putting people in jail. Even some of those folks are even saying, hey, you know, we need a better jail because if we are detaining people, it needs to be in a way that's humane. And um, they just recognize as well the need for us to have, um, you know, an updated uh, main jail. And so I think that across the board, even for people who you might think would be against us building a new jail, mm -hmm. would actually be supportive of it, just given that they've been able to see the conditions and understand the need. And, you know, what a jail could you know, what a 21st century jail could look like doesn't have to be what historically has been. And so as that, those community conversations start coming up, happy to um, be involved and help get the messaging out around that so we can, you know, have the community be in, in uh, part of that process as we're considering that moving forward. Yeah, thank you for your support. And and when that, when, when the main jail was built in the late 70s, early 80s, the average length of stay was about 30 days. And now we have people who we have 70% of the jail population that are pretrial. They're staying sometimes three, four, five. We had one stay as many as nine years pretrial. And th those facilities aren't built for that. And if, if and I would love to show you the Roundtree facility because that's really what a modern day uh, jail should look like. 
Great. And then um, just also want to express the appreciation for um, public safety on the North Coast. And I know with summer coming, a lot of folks have been concerned and they've really appreciated your presence up there to help deter some of the um, petty theft and other crimes that happen in the North Coast. And so just want to thank you all for being up there and for um, helping to keep the community safe, especially when we have high, um, high traffic and high visitation times. Thank you. And yeah, we'll, we'll be up there full time. Uh, we started on Memorial Day and we'll be there through Labor Day. Thank you. Any other comments from Supervisor, or Supervisor Hernandez? No, I just like I, well, thank you, for, first of all, for the presentation. Um, I wanted to just kind of uh, make sure that we also uh, address the new hires, I think. Uh, but we're going to eventually have to, all the departments are facing this uh, with new hires, but if uh, we can, you know, address those issues so that we don't have so many folks doing the overtime, I think. Um, It'd be great if maybe our CEO's office can assist in, in making sure that departments meet the requirements for the new hires uh, so we can, you know, resolve the issue with uh, overtime. Other than that, well, thank you for the presentation and thank you for opening up Blaine as well. well I'd just like to make a, a couple of brief comments and just sort of generalize the situation that we, we live in a really unique community and we are very fortunate to have a very unique leadership here. There are a lot of counties where the sheriff is in constant conflict with the board of supervisors, you know, or the community in general, not just in the state of California, but across the country. And I find in this community, so often Sheriff Hart and his leadership team and all of the deputies, I mean, the entire culture of the organization is how to meet the needs of the community, understand uh, the ethos of the community and try and lead in that way. We, we just hosted um, uh, the state attorney general recently in, in your, at your department, uh, and he, and he, he had a lot to say about the, about how progressive the community of policing culture here was in regards to behavioral health and other issues. Um, you know, the sheriff's office was the first to initiate the 21st century policing program in the United States, been recognized constantly on a national level for its innovation, um, has been an active participant in the criminal justice council, supervisor McPherson mentioned, and took all of the recommendations to heart. There, there wasn't, there was no pushback. There was a, how can we get ahead of this and make these changes? And these aren't seen so often. I think that conflict gets covered. And so you don't really get the credit when credit doesn't get covered in the same way. And on a secondary note, as someone who uh, managed a law enforcement budget for a decade, you know, Ms. Sams here has been doing this for a long time, doing an amazing job. I mean, it's a very complicated issue with state and federal grants and a number of mandates. And what this agency has to do with with Kletz and a lot of the other responsibilities that a sheriff's office might have that, that city police agencies don't have. And you never hear anything regarding impropriety regarding the finances of the sheriff's office, which is the largest general fund budget. So that is a real testament to you. The, what I'm saying is that it's working. The system is working and, and we only tend to acknowledge it when the system isn't working. And so I wanna make sure that your, your team recognizes that, uh, that we we value the work that you all do. Um, all right, I'd like to open it up to the community. Are there any members of the community? If I yes. could. I just I just wanted to acknowledge and, and thank you for all your work for uh, the, the Willowbrook Park and getting it named after Damon and then all of the work that's gone in behind that and all the work the county parks is doing on it and the CAO supported it and but uh, you've you've really driven that project and it, it means so much to the 350 people that work at the sheriff's office so thank you very much for that. Thank you, Sheriff. I'd like to open it up for the community an opportunity for you to address us on the sheriff corner budget. Welcome back, Mr. Whitman. Yeah, hello. Um, my name is James Ewing Whitman. Mr. Hart, that was actually as an excellent presentation by yourself and staff. You know, I'm 56. I think uh, when I was more behaving like a hooligan, maybe when I was 11, maybe it's debatable that I still am, but, uh, you know, I think law enforcement's job is about six times more difficult than it used to be. You know, there was a mem that showed up and what the picture was, you know, it looked like the Titanic was sinking and all you could see were human beings' hands with their phones. And, but besides that, they were drowning. So, you know, there, I think there's not, no one's perfect, no system's perfect, but um, without healthy law enforcement, you know, we can't really keep any kind of a peace. And I think another reason why the law enforcement's job or peace officer's job is so difficult is because the politicians are not supporting the public. 
Not for a second. You guys are supporting the corporation and everybody else are useless eaters. That's just the reality. So law enforcement's job is very challenging. And um, I think everybody could do a better job. And I wish that more citizens were actually trying to work together to help the future of humanity, which is the children. So thanks for the presentation. Thank you. Anybody else like to address us on the sheriff corner budget? <laughs> yes, Sheriff Hart, thank you for your comments. However, when I was looking at, you know, your uh, crime statistics, what is missing is the most fundamental problem here we have in Santa Cruz, which is domestic violence. And I would like to see that word domestic removed from violence because whether it's coming from a husband, a wife, a father, violence is violence. I am connected with thousands and thousands of parents who are terrorized here in Santa Cruz County by the family courts, by the allotted mental health workers. And Maya and Sebastian Lang, who were violently kidnapped in October, have resurfaced. They're posting videos of the maltreatment by Dr. Lynn Steinberg, who we make a claim that she needs to be prosecuted and arrested for the maltreatment and torture of those children, as does Dr. Rebecca Bailey, who has maltreated and tortured my daughter and thereby me and Justin Ling as the parents. These are true crime statistics and there's been a media blackout here in Santa Cruz County locally. However, um, and all the social media accounts, everyone is talking about Santa Cruz County and the kidnapped children and the violence. I know women who are scared to death. They have domestic violence restraining orders that are not being enforced, but yet someone like me who gets a fraudulent one attacked on me, then the police want to come down and beat me up because I'm trying to protect my daughter. We need to fix that. My stolen bike was just recovered from the Pogo Nip. I got onto a local website. The theft rate here in Santa Cruz is off the charts. And just because you haven't talked about it doesn't mean it's not happening. So be honest about what's happening here. You know, homicide is, well, that is a problem. There are far worse situations happening and it's the child trafficking. It's the child kidnapping. It's the terrorism of parents here in the community of Santa Cruz. And uh, we need to be real about that and we need to solve that problem. Thank you. Anybody else in chambers like to address this? Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. Thank you, Sheriff Hart and all of um, the people who go out on the streets into the jails every day. <laughs> Law enforcement's not an easy job, and especially in these times. And I wanna thank, I wanna thank the dedication for those who go out and try to do the right thing. Thank you. Um, I wanna clarify that uh, rape victims in this county do not have to go over the hill for the ex medical examinations that are needed for prosecuting their perpetrators. We've talked about that before, and I, I thought I understood it was going to change. But with uh, the DNA lab not being in, in a built yet, I want to I clarify that. Are, are rape victims still having to go over the hill? I also um, attended the military-grade weaponry town hall that you had um, earlier this month. That was very good. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask, however, that next year, as uh, Supervisor Hernandez asked if, when the board approved the report, that it happened in a different order. Um, just for transparency, which is what the people at that meeting were asking for, more rather than less, even though you don't have to do it by law. So, um, but I wanna thank you for having that town hall meeting and very, very patiently and thoroughly answering questions. Um, I, I want to speak to one of the challenges that you had on there about food. And I have seen in past years the problem with the contracting agency at Roundtree and, and the main jail for food. Um, I want to see that it gets back to cafeteria style mass feeding type and provide work for the um, inmates in the in these facilities to give them job skills and give them something to do and to reduce costs. I would like to see a, a, some kind of a garden at Roundtree, especially, even though um, it's right next to the county dump. Thank, thank you, <laughs> It would be. Thank you, Ms. Steinbrenner. Thank you, Ms. Steinbrenner. Thank you. Is there anybody else in chambers? 
Is there anybody online, Madam Clerk, for this item? We have no speakers online, Chair. Okay, we'll bring it back to the board for action on this item. Is there a motion? Move recommend action. Second. A motion from Supervisor McPherson and a second from Supervisor Koenig. If we could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Hernandez. Yes. McPherson. Aye. And Friend. All right, and that passes unanimously. Thank you all for your work. Appreciate Thank you staying this morning. We'll move on to item seven, which is to consider approval of the 23-24 proposed budget for the Parks, Open Space, and Cultural Services Department, including any supplemental materials and take related actions as outlined in the reference budget documents and recommended by the County Administrative Officer. We have the board memo, the line item detail, the supplemental budget, the fixed item, the, excuse me, the fixed assets, the continuing agreement list, and the unified be scheduled and with us today we have our director of parks mr gaffney and our deputy director Ms. really welcome both of you thank you for waiting this morning mr gaffney oh thank you chair friend i you took care of introductions i appreciate that i appreciate you guys hearing us out today also wanted to thank uh, budget, budget manager marcus pimental and cao carlos palacios for all their support and peter detlef says we uh, move forward with our budget presentation um i wanted to draw attention to this picture. Um, it was selected with great intention as we take a moment to look back um, so that we can move forward. And in 2018, we had a commitment with our nonprofit partner, County Park Friends. Um, as we adopted our first ever strategic plan, it was our shared commitment to access, equity, and inclusion. By 2019, we'd formed a plan to make swim lessons an option available to all children in Santa Cruz County. Fast forward through years of fires, floods, and a pandemic, and with the support of their outdoor equity program, we now have groups of youth participating in a series of learn to swim programs. This is a picture of the first group that started in March of this year. These future lifeguards, as we like to think of them, were identified as Live Oak residents, many within walking distance to the aquatic center. They would not have been able to afford swim lessons on their own. County Park Friends worked with park staff at our aquatic center to support our community by getting these kids into free swim lessons, as well as other recreational programs associated with the program, that program. Not only increasing safety for these children, but also providing them with a lot of fun and education. So we'll come back to that, but I just um, pretty proud that we were here at this moment and we were able to, to get there after years of work. So uh, thank you. Um, Moving on to what we're gonna be talking to you today about is our mission, our objectives, the services we provide, our parks, our fee updates and grants, and budget goals, a long range opportunities, and then of course the request that we're gonna be moving forward asking for. Just wanted to briefly go over our, sorry about that. Getting the hang of it there. It's been a while. Um, our mission statement, the county parks strive to provide well-maintained parks with a variety of recreational cultural services. That's what we always are looking to do. Um, in, in with our mission statement, we've also added um, what was I mentioned earlier, our strategic plan from 2018. Um, that was the first strategic plan our department had ever created or even thought about doing. And we were very proud to be able to adopt it in 2018. The four goals that came forward as part of that strategic plan were effective stewardship, our great facilities, a strong organization, and awesome programs. We're currently at our five-year mark, which is halfway through that 10-year strategic plan. And at the halfway mark, we said we'd come back and check in and see if we're, we're kind of on pace with what we said we'd want to be. Um, we feel we're pretty consistent with those, those goals, but we also realized that we um, failed to, to add a, a goal that was equity. Um, equity is built into a lot of these goals with objectives, but we, we feel like it's probably going to be something that we need to have as a fifth goal. Um, and so um, I think that's kind of our guiding principles. And, and as we look at the mission statement, that helps feed and inform that, that process. And now um, to go over our operational plan objectives, I'm gonna turn it over to Deputy Director Hurley. Good morning, board. So for the county's two-year operational plan, we have a, a numerous amount of objectives for the Parks Department. Some of those objectives are goals that are slated to be done in 2023 or have already been completed. One of them is opening our aquatic facility back to seven days a week when it had to unexpectedly close due to lifeguard shortage. As well, as Director Gaffney stated, it's updating our strategic plan, which we anticipate finishing in the next month and bringing back to the board in the fall. 
Other park objectives include making our programs and places more inclusive for all communities. One of these objectives is to remove the sand play servicing at at least five of our play areas and to replace with more inclusive play servicing with either wood chips or, or in place rubberized play servicing. We also want to increase the amount of recreational programming that we provide to underserved communities by bringing back our mobile recreation program, which we had about 15 years ago. This is a program that goes and takes mobile uh, recreation programming out to communities that can't come and um, access the currently provided um, programming that we have at our facilities. Another objective that we have is for the rail trail project. Currently housed in parks with co-sponsorship for CDI, to complete the environmental review documents for the segments 10 and 11, which is a project funded by the $68 million ATP grant. And lastly, Parks has an objective of aiming to find more sustainable and dedicated funding for our department so that we are not reliant on general funding to meet the needs of our community moving forward. So a little bit about our services and what we provide. We are the Parks Open Spaces and Cultural Services Department. We provide community outreach through cultural services, such as the County Art Public Art Program. Like seen in the picture here is the new mural by Taylor Reinhold, coordinated by uh, the NRG and County Park Friends Group at a county park site in Real de Mar. We also provide outdoor education on trails and in our open spaces through interpretive programming and signage. And as recently, we have brought back all of our interpretive programming at Quail Hollow Ranch County Park and are seeking to mimic the same programming in South County at Pinna Lake County Park in the next year. We operate and manage one of the largest aquatic facilities in the Tri-County area, open year round, seven days a week, providing swim lessons, recreation swim, adult lap swim, and therapeutic recreation uh, opportunities in warm water. We have our own planning and development team and plan to manage our own parks project within the parks department when we renovate playgrounds or put new amenities into our county parks. We also provide recreational programming for all ages throughout the unincorporated areas, which is unique for a county parks department, however appreciated by the large population that participates in them. <laughs> Okay, so as I'm, I'm sticking with my theme of, of looking back a little bit as we move forward, um, I wanted to draw your attention to the map of the county here with our parks in them. They're highlighted in green. And uh, just talk a moment about our redevelopment agency and how the uh, allocation of resources for parks were often determined by that over the last couple of decades. Um, and so you'll see a large number of parks that may be in the center of, the par the center of our county and actually right there in the Live Oak area. I also want to point out that a lot of the parks, because of the type of parks department we are and the size we are, end up being regional parks. They have a draw to them that are more for every resident in the county and or maybe um, even people who come out of the county. We have parks like the Aquatic Center at Simpkins. We have the Energy and Cummins. We have a Moran Lake or a Pleasure Point, uh, the Hook. Um, you have a Quail Canyon, you have a uh, Quail Hollow, I'm sorry, you have also um, Pinto Lake. So these are our regional type parks. Um, and the focus of those parks at times may have been inequitable. And so as we continue to move forward, we're looking at opportunities and how we can more evenly distribute parks, um, both geographically and for also the recreational opportunities they provide. Um, as I talked about a little bit about our regional parks, I just wanted to highlight a few of those as well. So um, some of the parks that we are probably not really aware of being oftentimes people within our county, I should say, aren't aware that there are their county parks. There are the Highlands Park and as I mentioned, Pinto and, and, and Quail Hollow and, and also uh, Moran Lake. Um, and so then the Simpkins Aquatic Swim Center, um, they are distributed throughout the county. We have Greyhound Rock as well that we've been uh, taking care of for a number of years. Um, they, have, they provide so many opportunities for people, whether it be recreational opportunities or outdoor spaces or trails to hike on or just the opportunity to get to a, a place of quiet serenity for a, a peaceful bit of meditation. Um, we also have playing fields. They also are quite involved as far as it, talk, as it takes uh, maintaining them, whether it's large tree maintenance, fire protection and fuel break, shaded fuel breaks, um, maintaining a large aquatic center like we do at Simpkins, um, the sensitive habitats that we have along uh, lagoons like Moran Lake, 
um, or Quail Hollow that has the Sandhills habitat. So all of those things are things that we take on willingly and also just a reminder to the board of how expensive and time consuming and, and difficult that could be. That said, um, I think it's uh, well known that we're a very innovative department and we often go out and find a lot of revenue um, that is external and not part of of the county resources and definitely not part of the general fund. Uh, this year we'll actually be using um, more money than 56% uh, of our funding that will be going into the budget will not be general fund money. So that's that's the highest that, since I've been here that we've been able to um, bring external revenue in from. In particular, if you look on this screen or if you look on this slide in the green and the external revenue that we're looking at there, a lot of those dollars um, aren't grant dollars, which is another creative way. We've continued to find collaboration and partnerships, um, things like our mitigation program at Energy and Cummings, where we're not only planting trees, um, helping with carbon sequestration, we're also um, generating revenue and staff time to be able to monitor our natural resources at the park, um, something that was uh, very much needed. Um, so overall, adding the grants and external revenue, just in this fiscal year alone, we brought in 3.27 million. This does not, however, include the $68 million active transportation grant for the rail trail segments 10 and 11 that will be starting to fund um, parts of our budget in 24-25. As I continue to talk about some of the things from the past, um, as I mentioned, I wanted to quickly highlight a, a fee update that we brought back, we brought to this board in, in June of 2021. Um, it seems like just yesterday, but um, this was uh, five years in the works and uh, we had a very complex funding process for what's considered park dedication um, at that time. And now we call it park impact fees. And uh, it was in 15 different development buckets um, and very difficult to utilize. We consolidated it all into one bucket. Um, thank you, supervisors. That was very helpful. Uh, it was a very difficult process. Um, and as we navigated through that, um, this last year, uh, actually last fiscal year, um, we were finishing the final um, bureaucratic processes. And, and we've been actually this current fiscal year, 22-23, able to start to see the revenue um, in one single bucket that we can expend for infrastructure. Um, it's solely used for improving facilities, adding new facilities, acquiring land. It has a very limited use at times, but um, it's been life-changing for the department to be able to actually have resources. And we're just now realizing that. And, and this board is gonna be very fortunate to be the beneficiary of that in the coming years. So I look forward to that. Um, it was very inequitable as well. Um, and so that was one of the big reasons we felt like it was important to um, change allows for this board to make decisions on where resources are distributed and they're not determinate on, on um, incomes and or where affluent areas are in the county or only places that can be developed. So as we look towards our budget goals, um, we're gonna continue to establish our relationships um, within the community as we have. Um, and then we're also gonna focus on achieving equity in South County and with both parkland and programs. Um, and especially in populations that have been historically underserved. And they have had not had, had the same opportunities to engage in programs and open spaces. As far as long range opportunities, we're gonna continue building parks and connecting our outdoor communities. I think this is uh, something that was really obvious during the pandemic, both um, from a, an environmental protection standpoint, um, a climate action or climate adapt, adaptation, aspect as well, um, that we need to have more connectivity to our open spaces, pathways and trails that connect high density neighborhoods to communities um, in general, so they can get to the open spaces without having to get into their cars. Um, we're continuing to strive to make that happen. Um, and then also we want to provide more programs to help people understand how they can uh, provide less waste do more recycling and lower their carbon footprint. We also r really are excited about the natural resource management programming that we started last year and to do that programming and expand it out through all of our, our county parks. We're preparing and, and, and getting ourselves used to the idea of having to respond, respond to natural disasters and or be prepared for that as we look at things like armoring up some of our, our coastal accesses, um, as I mentioned, shaded fuel breaks earlier, and also some of the work we need to do in, in our lagoons and waterways. 
protecting our water and natural resources. And we also have to think about our response to sea level rises in regards to those, uh, those access points. Um, and we also are continuing to create more um, natural resource management programming for kids so they understand what, they're, what the world is that is going on around them. We may have lost. Sorry about that. Um, what you would have seen on this slide that's not on here is we're asking you to approve our 23-24 county parks requested budget, and there'll be no net uh, county cost, no new net county cost. It's got three additional positions. It's just around $7 million. And as I said, no new net county cost, three additional positions. Um, I'll come back to that in just a minute. I also wanted to go back to the to the beginning of when I started this presentation and we talked about the, the free lessons and programming that we're doing. Um, our request to approve the proposed, proposed budget is adding the staffing so they can continue to support these partnerships and programs like the outdoor equity program that I mentioned in the beginning. And with County Park Friends and also uh, allowing us to expand these efforts throughout the county, especially for the most disadvantaged communities where youth that do not have regular access to the outdoors and nature or programs about the environment or learning how to swim, ending up like these two participants that you see on the screen who successfully graduated from their 16 lesson program this past April. Uh, the data and studies continue to show us that the more money and resources we can put into our children early and often, the less we will need to spend on them in their physical safety and health later in life. So I also wanted to just share with you that July is Parks and Recreation Month. Um, and don't forget that on July 29th, we'll be doing Family Fun Day at the Simpkins Swim Center. Um, it's a free fun family day for all of the parks departments in the county coming together and providing resources. We've done this in the past. We take over a large piece of land next to us that's got the, uh, the school district property, uh, thanks to the Live Oak School District. and um, it's a great event on July 29th. Um, we also have on August 19th, we have the Parks and Recs Day out at the Simpkins Swim Center as well. It's been a fundraiser between with us and the Animal Services Shelter. Um, it's been a great and successful event. Um, and then lastly, I just wanna thank all the partners. As I mentioned earlier, um, we're always finding ways to bring in revenue from other jurisdictions and or partnering so we can combine resources. And I'd ask for your approval on the recommended budget action. Thank you, Mr. Gaffney. Thank you, Ms. Hurley. Are there questions or comments from board members? Uh, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, you can start with somebody else maybe next time. <laughs> but, uh, I, I just want to say uh, there, there's one big lesson we learned with the uh, pandemic as how critical our parks is to our Santa Cruz County community that uh, really uh, you know, contributed to the overall health and uh, well-being of our community. And that can be overstated. Uh, it's taken for granted. And when we couldn't get together for activities, uh, people could get, get outside to go to their parks, take their walks, whatever it might be. Um, I don't know what we had done without it. I think it would have been really detrimental to our community possibly, but we're, we're fortunate to have a community that really does uh, have many beautiful places as we all know. And uh, we were just reminded how vulnerable our parks are uh, in these the recent past uh, in open spaces. I think in the uh, atmospheric atmospheric river storms, uh, the parks uh, had about eight million dollars worth of damages that was done, and you have a seven million dollar budget. Um, I, I think it, it goes out to you, Mr. Gaffney, and your staff of how successful you have been in getting these grants that have really. Uh, really stabilize our park system in Santa Cruz County. Um, it's really remarkable what you have done um, to, and then to allow our 43 parks, I think that's what we have in the county system, uh, to, to go on uh, pretty much business as usual as quickly as possible. Uh, so a huge amount of credit. And I, I really am uh, uh, pleased to see uh, the increased investment in our outdoor equity program that we have. I, um, I think we've been trying, to, no question that we've been trying to serve everybody in this county throughout the years, but uh, to have a, a new focus on that is really great. Um, we know the community appreciates your work and I'll, I'll sh share one recent example of how quickly you get on it. Um, when a vehicle crashed into the Felton deck in my district uh, just about two two weeks ago, uh, just a few days before the Memorial Day Parade, of which I was a grand marshal, as a matter of fact, 
park was up and running, you rebuilt it. I mean, that is quick action and you got right on it. And it's a gathering spot for people in the San Lorenzo Valley at Felton and very much appreciated. So um, I think um, what you have done with what you, the amount of funding that you have is truly remarkable. And you've to be given credit to everybody in your staff for really doing a job, having done a job well done. Thank, thank you, Supervisor. You. Supervisor Cummings. I just wanted to thank you for that presentation. And then um, also just thank you for all the time that you, you and your staff have taken to help me get on board with um, learning about the park system and all the different issues that are facing the parks. In particular, I know there's been a lot of issues with Greyhound Rock, and I know that we're also working on the uh, North Coast kind of master plan. And so just want to appreciate um, all the work that's been going into those efforts and um, uh, just looking forward to um, seeing the plan in particular, because I know there's been a lot of folks who are right. eager to see that North Coast master plan, um, but I just want to uh, express my appreciation for all your work and look forward to continuing to work with you. We look forward to the future. Thank you. Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Director Gaffney and Deputy Director Hurley. Um, and I really want to thank you guys for getting Simpkins back open seven days a week. Uh, it's such an important facility, as you highlighted in the presentation. And I think also as the many happy faces of the Memorial Day swim yep. over the long weekend demonstrated. So um, thank you for, for getting that lifeguard program together and getting those positions filled. And like you said, hopefully the, all those kids that are learning swim for the first time will be our yes, future really lifeguard birds. force. <laughs> um, I'm also really just excited about all the parks work that's happening in the first district in general. Um, the planning work happening at Morin Lake. Um, we mentioned replacing some of those uh, different uh, sand areas, play structures, felt street. Obviously, I think this year we're going to hopefully get break ground and um, leverage all those funds that the community raised with some some public money as well and um, get that park uh, a nice facelift. And I think that park also demonstrates really well. I mean, um, the importance of, of working with county park friends, as you highlighted at the beginning of the presentation, um, but also how a lot of the parks in the first district serve very diverse income um, categories. I mean, we've got Yes, some folks with high-end homes there in Pleasure Point, but also a um, good number of mobile homes up 38th, just a, a block and a half uh, that use that park a lot as well. Um, also really appreciate how uh, creative you guys are in terms of identifying other revenue opportunities. Um, did have one question about that, which was, um, it seemed like the second largest uh, revenue source or sort of alternative revenue source that you listed was the Coastal Encroachment Program at $550,000 in this uh, next year's budget. Um, what was it? What, what did we take in last year? I was trying to find that in the line item. And I'd, I'd have to get back with you on the number, but I know it was less than $100,000 probably last year. Right. Yeah. So I was just wondering. So some potential changes in the yes. program there that you're, you're planning yes. on. We've had some successes. And um, I think the program, um, as endorsed by this board, we wanted to come and bring uh, re, uh, revisit some of the aspects of the program anyway. So I, I, I should be coming before you and within the next six months um, with an update to that. But I think that will be um, more effective and efficient. And I think more people have bought into the program, understand the program and appreciate it. So we're proud of that. Okay. It's taken a couple of years. Yeah. Four right. or five. We'll look forward to discussing further. Uh, yeah. I know there's definitely some opportunities along East Cliff um, too. We we're discussing with um, CDI as well. Maybe some, some grant opportunities to really improve the public facilities there for sure. Um, so my questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Hernandez. You know, thank you for the tours as well. And I really enjoyed the Sim uh, visiting the Simpkin Swim Center. Um, I've been there for community meetings, but never really seen the pool and all the activities that happen there. Um, so, you know, I, I, and I think it's going to be a, a good opportunity when it comes to the equity and bringing uh, students out there to the swim center. You know, we, I didn't have that growing up. Uh, as a as a you know an asset and so I, I never learned how to swim um it's kind of got thrown in to learn how to swim as an adult once I was in the military but <laughs> but it's great that we have those opportunities now and I'm really uh happy to hear that equity is now going to be part of the mission statement as well thank you thank you supervisor thank you supervisor Hernandez and I just want to acknowledge how much your entire team does with very little contribution really quite frankly from the county i think that you've done a um it's kind of a double-edged sword you've done a really good job with public private partnerships public nonprofit partnerships 
uh, telling a narrative and a story that compels the community to give. But as a result, that means that the county ends up not contributing probably what it needs to long term to make for a sustainable uh, parks world. And I think that, uh, you know, I know that there was a, a line and a slide from Ms. Hurley about by December of 2025 on a more sustainable funding. And I'd be interested to see what ideas you have moving forward on that, because I think that um, it wasn't just the the pandemic it was just the fact that you know that our community really does value outdoor resources and uh, given all the other health challenges that people are having not engaging in, in these kinds of resources is very important that we do these investments in particular in the south county i'd like to say that and we've done it together i mean just in the last few years we've we've done more um Park investments in in the second district that have been done in the in two decades before that, and and it's it's pretty amazing to see what's still coming online. Uh, so I'm proud of that work that you've done. But uh, to the degree that um, even from a positional standpoint, you think that greater uh, management on the grant side or the nonprofit side should be in house is a discussion that I'm still open to within your department. Um, I recognize that you have fiscal staff already, but I mean, people that are more specifically focused on some of the partnerships with say the, the park friends example might make sense. Right. Um, and anything that, that can continue that outdoor, excuse me, the outside revenue streams would make sense, but we do need to look internally about how we're going to increase these revenue streams. Cause it's really not uh, sustainable with some of the uh, lack of investment in general infrastructure. So again, just this appreciation of your work. We'll open it up now for the community. Is there anybody in chambers that would like to address us on the parks budget? This would be your opportunity. Uh, good morning, welcome back. Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. Um, thank you for the report. I'm surprised you didn't mention the uh, county's focus on acquiring the 188 Whiting Road South County Park. Um, that's That's one of the top legislative priorities that the board has identified and it's a big piece of property. I have a lot of concerns about that property being a public park, although I think South County needs more um, because of the access. It's way out by the fairgrounds. How are kids going to get there? Go along 152, that's not safe. <laughs> Even with the uh, some of the bike lane things, they're, they're not going to be building a separate bike lane uh, with the Caltrans improvement project out there. So I would like your department to really consider looking at the piece of property that the county already owns within the city of Watsonville behind the county clinics. I bring it up a lot because it's behind Crestview on Freedom Boulevard. And I always think it's a good place to do um, emergency housing as the county did do after the 1989 earthquake, but the county seems uh, reluctant to do so. So let's make it a park. Let's put it where the people are and on the transportation line instead of way out by the county fairgrounds. Um, you, you, mes you mentioned a, a pot of money. Well, that was measure G. And in that pot of Measure G money, $425,000 was earmarked for Aptos Village Park. I haven't seen any plan of what's going to happen at Aptos Village Park with that money. There's no play structure there. You've let me know in correspondence there are no plans to put play structures there, and I want to know why. The uh, Cabrillo Host Lions built and donated that community center to the, the parks in the 70s, and that's a gem and brings in a lot of money. So let's support that. What is the Quimby Act uh, dollar amount with development? That will be huge coming in with arena numbers. And let's build some community gardens around. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Steinbrenner. Is there anybody else in chambers that would like to address us on the parks budget? Is there anybody online that would like to address us on the parks budget? Okay. See, now we'll bring back to the board. A uh, motion would be appropriate. The recommended actions. We have a motion from Supervisor Koenig, a second from Supervisor McPherson. If we could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Yes. McPherson? Aye. And Friend? Aye. And that passes unanimously. Thank you both for your work on that. Uh, we'll now move on to. Item eight, which is to consider approval of the 23-24 proposed budget for the community development and infrastructure department, including any supplemental materials and take related actions as outlined in the reference budget documents and recommended by the CAO. 
We have the budget hearing board memo, the line item detail, the supplemental budget, the fixed assets, the continuing agreements list, the unified fee schedule, the proposed uh, capital infrastructure budget. And we have um, Mr. Matt Machado, who's our deputy CAO and director of community development and infrastructure. And happy birthday, Mr. Machado. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Friend and Supervisors. Uh, Matt Machado, Director of Community Development Infrastructure. I want to start by uh, uh, just saying that I'm happy and proud to present this combined budget for the second year in a row. Uh, you all, uh, actually, CAO Carlos Palacios merged the two departments together, and I thought it was uh, a great plan. And we're a year and a half into it. This is our second presentation. So I'm quite excited to do that. Um, let's see if I can make this work today. So today I'm going to cover uh, these agenda items. Um, I will actually cover each of them closely to each division, the division of public works and the division of planning. Um, but before I dig into those, I want to just start by thanking the board for your continued support. Uh, oftentimes you're the, you're the front line to our community. And so members come to you and and uh, you filter it and you assist them and then you direct them our way and we continue to assist and it's just a great partnership. And uh, so I greatly appreciate your support and your hard work. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Carlos Palacios, our CAO. Um, even considering all the responsibilities and duties he has, he still finds time to really engage in, in our department and our issues. Uh, he's very hands-on in a very positive way. And so I want to thank him for that and thank him for his leadership. And so we've got a, we've got a great team. So I will start here with our uh, public works uh, division. So the services we provide are listed here. This is a, a $227 million proposed budget. We'll, I'll talk more about that in a bit. Uh, some of the services here include 600 miles of roads, um, you know, and then you look at those 600 miles and the type of traffic we have in this county. And uh, this is kind of a, a, an approximation, but we see about 300,000 vehicle miles traveled every day on county maintained roads, just in our county and just on county maintained roads, which county maintained roads only make up about half of our road system in this county. A lot of them are privately maintained. So just a lot of traffic we deal with. So the, the traffic management is a, is a really a big deal. Um, under the sanitation area, uh, our group manages the operations and maintenance of eight systems. And that's in addition to our large sanitation district, which is not a part of this budget. But I, I mention it because uh, it really speaks to the amount of work that our staff does and responsibility. And it's just a great program. Under our recycling and solid waste, uh, we provide curbside service for all the unincorporated area. And we provide many services for the entire county. HHW, uh, the landfill, the transfer station, that's open to, to everybody that lives in our county. And so it's a great service. Every single resident of our county uses multiple of these services every single day. Uh, these are really life essential services. On our planning, uh, in our planning division, this is uh, about a $16.8 million proposed budget. Um, actually, you know what? I apologize, I'm gonna back up because all these services are provided by a great team, a great leadership team. And so I want to recognize uh, the assistant directors in this area. Uh, they are Kim Moore, Kent Edler, Steve Wiesner, and Travis Carey. Just a great team of leaders to, uh, to implement these services. In the planning area, uh, it's a proposed $16.8 million budget. And I'd like to uh, acknowledge and thank the leadership in this area. Uh, they are Stephanie Hansen and Carolyn Burke. They just, they work so hard and they provide so much guidance and they're very hands-on. And so um, it's a testament to them, the good work that we're able to do as a department. Uh, in this area, you know, we're really focused on, on, on housing. You know, most of the services you see here support improved and increased housing, which as you all direct us and know, it's just such a high priority for our community to have uh, more housing, affordable housing. Uh, additionally, in most of our community relies on these services on a very regular basis. Uh, and a lot of these services is really an effort to impl implement state and federal regulations. Uh, and our team is, is good at it. And they're really trying to continue to improve upon some of these services with very limited, 
very limited resources. Next, I'm going to cover some of our operational uh, plan. So in the Public Works Division, we're really focused on uh, storm damage repairs. This seems to be an ongoing struggle for us, but operational plan includes uh, some significant elements here that we're focused on. Bridge repair, managing our solid waste, continuing to, to wrap up our library construction, continuing to focus on road resurfacing, sewer replacement of our aging infrastructure, and, and then finally, development of an organic facility or another organic solution. Uh, any, you know, we're looking at multiple ways to, to uh, uh, reuse, dispose of organics in our county. In our planning division, uh, some of the uh, focus for our operational plan includes our website redesign. Uh, and it's, it's actually a combined effort, but um, there's a lot of leadership coming out of our planning division to, uh, to work the, to work on the website, which will mean a consolidated uh, pages, reformatted, improved. Uh, to begin with, they had 700 pages of data and that's the, the two departments together. And so the goal here is actually to, uh, we're hopeful to go live the end of this calendar year. So really excited for that. I think it'll be a, a real uh, helpful tool for the, for the community and, and for you all as well. Uh, we continue to pursue uh, streamlining for our subdivision approvals. Uh, we're working hard on our housing element update, uh, developing a homeless encampment team uh, to, to address some of those needs. We're really working hard to reduce our building permit review. We're trying to make that a, a timely effort. Uh, we continue to focus on vacation rental enforcement and developing uh, more equity in our community outreach. So a lot of exciting operational uh, plan objectives. Some of the some of the focus and highlights of our our budget goals are, are here, and so um, in the public works division, we continue to maximize the benefit uh, while still being fiscally responsible. Um, we still are pursuing grant funding opportunities, and, and we'll see a little more about some of our successes there. Uh, we're, we're we continue to focus on uh, fully staffed operations and uh, continue to invest in fleet assets, which which results in improved efficiency and effectiveness. And then lastly, um, we're really focused on uh, improvements uh, that provide uh, public safety. Safety really is the, the name of the game when you're talking about infrastructure, roads, bridges, and on all the sorts. So safety is everything. Some of our, our uh, budget goals in our planning division include uh, the continued focus to stand up the unified permit center. This is, this is one of the primary objectives of merging the two departments together about a year and a half ago. Uh, we continue to support the recovery permitting. Uh, we're really focused on permit streamlining and uh, we're working hard to reduce permit application review uh, timelines. Some of the community benefits and, and focused first on the, the public work side, uh, we see um, the benefits include the local road network, uh, collection and treatment of, of wastewater, um, the responsible uh, solid waste management, and growing all, our alternative transportation networks. And so uh, those are direct community benefits that, that many people use every single day. In our planning division, <clears throat> some of the benefits that we want to highlight include uh, protecting life and safety through the implementa implementation of the building code, uh, providing and providing environmental stewardship, uh, conducting long range planning, supporting the development of housing for all income levels and improving equity and public outreach activities. We're really trying to capture the voice of all the people of our community so that we can develop uh, uh, guidance and policy uh, that serves everybody equally and, and well. Digging into a little bit of the numbers in our uh, public works division, I just want to highlight a few things here. Uh, at the top, you can see just some slight fluctuations in our transportation and special, special services. What's really driving the change is the uh, timing of project delivery. And that's what causes the fluctuation in our budget. Um, and then the administrative services, really the change there is, is, uh, is our employee or labor contracts that are in place uh, that include um, some cost of living increases but if you look at the bottom right, 
the change from our current year into our proposed year is just a 1% change. It's, it's a very slight change, uh, even though there's some significant changes in our project delivery just due to that timing. But overall, it's, it's, a, it's a virtually a status quo budget. Just a, a few more highlights on the public works proposed budget. Uh, we are recommending uh, nine uh, full-time equivalent uh, additions to our, our staffing. There's actually a typo on this page, and I apologize for that. I, I can't believe it's it's actually been here for some time, and for some reason, I just didn't catch it. Um, but you can see in that recycled solid waste, three add, added FTEs is actually two, uh, and it's two transfer drivers. And the goal here is to is to really increase and get ready for the future of of hauling a lot of our waste to Marina. We have a contract with them. It's a good contract. It's the, it's the most cost-effective way to deal with our solid waste. And so this is adding two um, transfer truck drivers. And then the third position there of the three is actually a um, engineering aid to assist in our transportation group. Uh, their workload is immense with the storm damage. We'll talk a little bit about more, more about that storm damage. And then the five um, in the far right column is in our construction engineering group. And for the past five years, we spent more than a million dollars on consultants, which is necessary. Consultants are a really key part to managing the workload. But this is an effort to reduce that spend to have overall savings. These positions are fully funded by projects, so they are not a, a, a cost to the net county cost um, side of our, our budget. Uh, and then the last position there is really a uh, staffing structure change to promote career development and succession planning. It does not result in a new body. Uh, overall, though, all that said, in terms of our staffing levels, we do have about a 15% vacancy rate in our public works division. Uh, it's just a real challenge to recruit and retain um, uh, employees, staff of all types. Um, certainly in, the, in some of the unique positions, it's, it's extra challenging. In the planning division, uh, we're really um, very little change here. It's actually a net zero staffing from a staffing perspective. There's funding of one new position, but there's also unfunding of another position. So it's a net zero. Um, and this is really due to limited budget capacity. Um, it doesn't mean that there's not a need. There is a significant need to add staffing resources, yet without significant or um, adequate revenue to support. It's just not in the cards for this year. And uh, we'll mention a little more about that here in a second. <clears throat> I do want to highlight a few of our larger, more critical projects. And so we've been talking a bit about storm damage. And here's a, some quick numbers. So from the 23 storms, January, February, March, 184 damage sites, roads, road damage sites. Um, our goal this year is to have 71 of those complete. That's a really tall order. So, so the team is exceptionally busy. Uh, and at great cost, and we'll talk about some of those costs here in a bit. Additionally, uh, projected for this proposed budget year are some, some really critical projects. SoCal Drive has five and a half miles of improved uh, signal timing, improved bicycle lanes, improved pedestrian facilities. Uh, it's a project that'll serve the entire county. Uh, additionally, the emergency route resurfacing, um, that includes uh, the roads Alba and Jameson, um, some great projects there especially considering the necessity of, a, of solid, reliable evacuation routes. Um, Green Valley is a, is a really exciting project. That's a $5 million grant to, uh, to build a dedicated uh, bicycle and pedestrian facility on Green Valley Road. The 2023 pavement management project, that's 16 miles of resurfacing. One of the big, biggest resurfacing projects we've ever pulled together. It's got all kinds of funding sources. We, we dug into the couch found some pennies and nickels and pulled it all together to, to deliver this project. We're really excited about it. And then Highway 152 at Hollihan, that project's finally going to construction. I think it's been decades. I know some, some folks, actually Steve Wiesner, one of our uh, uh, longstanding uh, staff members, he's been here 20 years, by the way, we gave him a, an award this year. He's done some great work for this county. And uh, he told me recently that one of the first projects he worked on was this project 20 years ago, actually more than 20 years ago, he said. So finally coming to fruition. So we're very excited about that. 
uh, in our special services, just a one one quick highlight. We've actually you've heard me say uh, talk a bit about freedom sanitation in the past. So I won't spend time on that, but I do want to highlight a really great project up in Davenport. Uh, we have a water storage tank project. It's two new tanks uh, that include a two and a half million dollar grant. So a really great grant for um, a community that really needs needs that support. Uh, they can get cut off from water pretty quickly because it's surface water. So tanks will provide emergency uh, uh, supply and those times where, you know, fire or storms uh, cut off their supply. I'm going to end on the storm damage point. Um, that's clearly the biggest lift that we are undertaking right now. Storm damage does continue to deplete all of our resources. And for quite a few years now, uh, SB1, which is a uh, gas tax, has been uh, overwhelmingly dedicated for our local match. Um, it's a challenge and, and it's even been a challenge for a general fund. The general fund has had to contribute some funds for storm damage local match. And it's just a, it's just a burden on this county. It'll continue to be that way. And it's such a, it's such a depletion of our service or um, funding that we're projecting in this current fiscal year um, to carry a negative fund balance of about a million dollars. And even in next year, we expect a negative $2 million fund balance at the end of the year due to all the storm damage uh, needs and, and repairs. And so that will continue to be a struggle for us. On the um, uh, some of our requests and current projects in our planning division include our, our UPC remodel. This, is, uh, this has been, it's been taking us some time, but it's a big lift. And, and so there's a... Uh, there's a co-location or there's a emerging of people and emerging of office spaces. So we've been working closely with general services to implement this project. A couple of other projects I want to highlight on the, on the right column there, some of the new projects. Uh, we're kicking off a digitization project. Currently, we uh, store paper files offsite at significant annual costs. And so we're starting the process right now to digitize those and at some point to eliminate that cost of offsite storage. Uh, the fee study there is really an effort to maximize cost recovery for the services that we provide. And hopefully this results in some increased staffing in the future. That's the, the staffing comment I made earlier. And then uh, the third party plan check is really a, a significant increase in budget for this to, to address our overdue plan check reviews. And uh, we're already seeing some great gains in this area. Uh, in terms of some fiscal sustainability, uh, we continue to maximize leverage grant funding. Um, you know, I just mentioned the fee study in an effort to maximize cost recovery. And then um, within budget constraints, we continue to uh, use data to make good decisions and continuous process improvements. On the state front, uh, we continue to watch, track, and pursue all things that affect us, both on the planning and the public works side. And so we're very active in the legislative world to monitor those changes and the effects on our department. Some future considerations. I'll start with the public work side. Uh, on that top left, that FEMA process, we've talked a lot about that recently. I just want to share one number. In our current budget year, uh, we're expecting to spend $150,000 on interest payments for monies that we've had to borrow to complete some of these federal aid FEMA projects because of the slow reimbursement from FEMA. And this proposed budget year, we're expecting to spend $300,000 on interest, interest payments only, because it takes so long for FEMA to approve and reimburse this county. This is something you've heard a lot about, but this is how it affects this one department. And it's a, it's a big effect. Uh, a couple other highlights here. You see the continued deferred um, maintenance in roads and in culverts. We do plan to bring back uh, or bring together a program on our culverts to systematically make repairs and investments. And we'll share more about that with you. For the past couple of years, we've been gathering great data so that we can take some small steps forward to start solving that problem. On the, uh, the planning front, uh, we continue, and we talked a bit about this, but we continue to work on our, our UPC, our Unified Permit Center, uh, both the front counter and the office space. Uh, this is a big lift, but but we're working steadily on it and we're looking forward to, to that conclusion in the next uh, year or two. Also in our recovery permitting um, uh, revenues and third-party plan check services, we're seeing great progress there. 
I've shared with uh, many of you that progress. Historically, it's been a challenge to keep up with those plan check services with the staffing levels that we have. We've used um, third-party plan check services and we're reducing that as we speak today. Uh, the satellite service counter, certainly an exciting time for the future. Uh, it'll be a staffing challenge, but it's also exciting to be able to provide services where people live and where they want those services and need those services. And then of course, housing is continued effort, uh, especially with regard to affordable, affordable housing. So today's, uh, today's item includes a proposed budget that includes a few of these elements. Um, and our public works division, it does include a $2.9 million general fund contribution to address the storm damage. It also includes the nine uh, full-time equivalents added, uh, fully funded, of course, with projects. On the planning side, um, really no change with staffing, and uh, but it, the budget does include those few contracts that I described earlier. The recommended actions today are to approve the 23-24 proposed budget for the Community Development Infrastructure Department, including any supplemental materials as provided uh, in the reference budget documents. And here today, uh, our leadership is here in the in the chambers and between them and myself, I hopefully we can answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Director Machado. Um, we'd like to open it up for the board, uh, minus Supervisor McPherson for questions um, to start. So uh, <laughs> Supervisor Cummings. Thank you for the presentation today. And I um, just wanted to start by just appreciating the work of your department, um, especially as it relates to the storms that we've been experiencing this past winter. Um, some of the damage that we saw, just I don't think anyone anticipated how badly we'd be being impacted by the storms. And your teams were out, you know, 24 seven, trying to make sure that people were able to get to and from their homes and able to have access um, in case of an emergency. And just want to appreciate um, all the work that, that your staff has done. And especially as it relates to fixing potholes uh, throughout Empire Grade and other parts of my district, because I know that was the big issue for us, but there were more pressing issues for other areas. And also the work that went into securing um, the Pajaro uh, River levee as it relates to potentially having threatened the wastewater treatment plant in, uh, mm -hmm. in Watsonville. I know that um, making sure that that didn't happen was a, a huge priority. And, and it was great to see that we were able to, um, that your team was able to get out there and, and really do such amazing work during um, a really challenging time. Um, yeah. And, and, um, and in addition to that, I also do want to appreciate, you know, coming in as someone new, the work that um, your staff did to address, you know, a lot of the concerns related to four leaf that we've been hearing. And um, I know Supervisor McPherson had been hearing similar concerns and, and your staff really stepped up to try to address those concerns and just want to also express appreciation on that front as well. Um, I did have a couple quick questions and a couple other comments. Um, I was looking through the budget and I know you mentioned um, encampment cleanup and I was just wondering um, what that amount was or if you know if you don't have those numbers right now, maybe offline, if you could provide those. I just wanted to see um, and, and better understand what funding was available for encampment cleanup. Sure, absolutely. So I don't have the number off the top of my head, but I will share with you that uh, we're planning and working hard to put together a committee that would include multiple departments, multiple funding sources. So as we put that together, we'll bring that to you. Uh, I'll share the numbers that I have offline, uh, but it'll be, it's gonna, we plan it to be a mix between our solid waste group, uh, the housing group in our county, uh, the sheriff's office, um, environmental health. And so we're gonna try to put together a team and leverage all those resources into one concerted effort to get the most out of those funds. I'm certain it won't cover all of our needs, but I think if we can consolidate those efforts into a focused focused way, we'll get more for our money. So I'll share with that, share offline with you. Great, appreciate that. Um, the other question I had, I know you mentioned the vacancy rate for public works, but I was wondering if you had the vacancy rate as well for planning. I do, it's about 9%. Thanks. Um, the, the next comment I had, um, I noticed in the agenda packet that there was kind of a breakdown of, you know, the different years of storms and the road projects. I think it would be helpful if there's maybe another column added where you could have that by district because um, since I don't know all the roads um, that are listed there, it'd just be helpful for me to be able to communicate back and probably for all the board members to be able to give a heads up to our constituents around which roads 
are on track for being repaired this year. And, and also it helps people understand too. I've noticed that there's roads that go all the way back to 2017, 2018 and getting people to understand that it's a, you know, we're still working through trying to make repairs to damage that was done, you know, years ago, let alone what we have on deck for this year. And so it would be really helpful just to have that breakdown as well. We can do that. We actually had one of those maps from 2017 and we mm -hmm. color coded the priority and showed it graphically on the on the and the entire county. We'll do that again for the uh, 23 storms. That's a great suggestion. Thank you. Thanks. And then uh, last comment I had is just as the um, as you know the the um, the permitting center gets developed, um, we consistently have people showing up to the meetings who have been you know complaining about the permitting process and lags and needing to go get extensions and all those kinds of things that can impact um, people's ability to to build more quickly. And so to the extent that we can continue to work on um, making that process more efficient, I think people would really appreciate that as yes. well. Yeah, we will do. We're trying. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Hernandez. Well, thank you for the presentation as well. And, you know, I just want to really thank you and all the work that you guys have been doing on some of the, the permit streamlining, uh, the work with the uh, four leaf that, some of the new positions you have to also, you know, help out with this process of uh, streamlining and the third party plan check um, group that you guys uh, got. I think it's, um, you know, really going to help out both in actually in South in South County, too, as well. If, you know, the pe people get permits in in uh, Supervisor Pearson's district. Um, and again, thank you for all the work on the on the uh, storm damage and recovery. Um, all the work on the river and our creeks as well uh, in South County. I, I think that, you know, I'm looking forward to the, for the levy project to begin there on the creeks because there's a lot of work to be done. And um, just, a, a, you know, I wanted to mention for the uh, encampment work there, task force that you're putting together, I think that it's also probably important to bring in community partners as well. Uh, we have a lot of community partners in South County and, of course, behavioral and human services as well. Um, it's, uh, we have to find a way to maximize the, the, our monies, right, our funds that we have so that we're not using too much of community development's money or public works' money for these projects. But if we can maximize our community partners as well, that, that's also another avenue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Director Machado. Um, I'll heap on a little bit more praise as far as the uh, storm damage response. You know, I think in the first district, we had uh, one of the poster childs of your department's fast work with Main Street. Uh, and you guys getting that uh, com completely washed out as Bates Creek uh, flooded that area. I mean, just startling footage. Um, and you guys got it prepared within 24 hours. So amazing work. And hopefully as you move towards a permanent bridge replacement there, uh, it'll be a poster child of how we build back better as well. Um, and I think also I should want to give a shout out to uh, road superintendent Alex Sandoval as well. Um, 400 million in deferred culvert maintenance. I mean, I knew we had a problem with culverts in this county, but um, I didn't realize it was that large. I mean, that wasn't a typo. No, 400 not a, million. Not a culverts. typo. We have about 6,000 culverts and uh, we've been gathering data on them for a couple of years and the condition of some of them are really dire. And so that number is accurate. I'm just surprised that it's actually a larger number than like the resurfacing work, right? Right, right. It's amazing. Well, it's the hidden, the hidden challenge we have. Yeah, well, I mean, it's not hidden until they collapse. <laughs> it's great. quite obvious, unfortunately. Okay, well, um, yeah, that is a big hole to fill. Um, also, I just want to commend uh, the, the planning side of the department for the work you're doing, reforming the permitting process. Um, I mean, it's just uh, overall, I think making all the right moves there. Uh, it's really great to, to uh, finally brought on Brian Rubin, the Unified Permit Center, uh, and be moving forward there. Um, and, you know, I, I, I also really glad to see the third party plan check contract. Of course, the first priority is always to hire more planners. We'd love to do that, all that work internally. But ultimately, I think that uh, the work environment is going to be more satisfying for new recruits if they're coming in and there's, you know, we're, we're on top of things. The backlog's not huge. Um, so I, I'm glad, grateful for that contract. I think it'll um, you know, ultimately create a better permitting environment for people actually applying for a permit because they don't have to wait as long, but also for our employees. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and the supervisor Cummings had a follow-up. Yeah, 
there's a quite one question I forgot to to ask. Uh, me, my office has been contacted by a number of environmental nonprofits in the community who um, the county and cities all oftentimes support to help with beach cleanups and educational programs around environmental health. And um, one of the things that they had mentioned was that they hadn't really received any increases. And so I was just wondering if there's potentially funds available um, to help support some of those organizations, given the increase in um, in interest rates and cost of living and all those things that we've seen over the past year. Sure. I know on, uh, on a few of those contracts, we are seeing some increases. And then uh, on another one or two that we have some longer term agreements in place, and I'm sure we'll when it's time to update those agreements, we will consider those actual inflation inflation costs. They're real. And so we're certainly working with those agencies or those nonprofits to to address those costs. Yes, we're doing that. Thank you. Supervisor McPherson. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yesterday, we sung the praises of the Health and Human Services for their responses to the fires and the COVID and the uh, the storms that we've just re, uh, today, um, it's to planning public works and uh, under the first year, first full year of uh, the community uh, development infrastructure department uh, led by you and, uh, and so many of your staff members to take full credit for what you've done with uh, so much work ahead of you. Um, it's been a, a constant demand, I know, for the response and recovery. Um, and all this has taken place while you tackle the backlog of our infrastructure needs and managing our waste and all. And you mentioned the Marina facility and I've, we visited that a year ago, at least I guess it was. And uh, what a phenomenal site it was and what they do with our waste. People should feel really good that our waste is, is uh, being put to good use, so to speak, I guess, but uh, really a phenomenal uh, contract that we have with them. And uh, I, I really appreciate you're getting that together. Um, and I, I'm glad to see this budget supports the, and to provide more work on the backlog of uh, the building permits and as well as supporting the capital projects that are out there. Uh, as mentioned by other departments, we recognize you're doing this with a high vacancy rate, but um, we want, I want to really thank, and I know we all do, uh, of your, the whole department and what you've done, the response that you've had. Um, we're fortunate to have Four Leaf to uh, and other consultants to maintain some critical services, help us maintain those. Um, and I, I want to also congratulate this board and uh, and you for uh, that we've redu we've reduced and waived some fees in this rebuilding process. I don't think people have uh, realized that that was done a couple of years ago, but uh, that's helped a lot. And uh, I know you could use that money, but uh, the people that need to rebuild probably need it more than uh, than anybody. They do need it more than anybody else. Um, I also um, appreciate the staff, the time that you invested in uh, developing the county service area seven expansion in my district for Boulder Creek that has garnered, uh, it garnered a $2 million federal earmark by Congresswoman Eshoo. Um, we have a long way to go with that project, but my hope is that we're going to be able to uh, secure some additional funding for that. And I know our Congressman Panetta, who represents that area now with the redistricting that just took place, uh, he's on top of that and he really wants to do a lot for that. And I also want to acknowledge, <clears throat> excuse me, the department's work for uh, the residents in the Big Basin Water Company, a private enterprise that's overseen by the state but we're working uh, we're working to see how that can get online and be upgraded greatly to serve not only the 600 plus customers of Big Basin, but the downtown Boulder Creek area as well. It's complete. It's uh, very, very vital. Uh, it's all septic systems up there. And uh, we really need outside of the CS area itself. Uh, but um, there, there's um you know, the, the, the building permit timeline that was mentioned by Supervisor Cummings is, is really one that I hear day and night. Um, and I hope we can improve on that. And I think you're moving toward that end. And, you know, this past, past year's budget was the first full year for CDI as a combined Department of Public Works and Planning. And from the programmatic and the budget perspective, um, have there been any lessons that you've learned, basically, that you think this budget improves upon? Um, you know, delivering services more quickly or? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, I will say though that um, uh, permanent good change does take time. So it's taken some time, uh, but I also can see that the two departments together is a natural fit. They really are. Uh, there's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of common direction that 
that the two departments have. Uh, and there's really some great synergy. And one of the things that we're going to see in this coming budget um, proposal and fiscal year is, is a synergy in the engineering side. And we're putting together a permit engineering group that will include, you know, some of the, the ge geology group, the, some in grading engineering from the planning side with uh, similar engineering expertise from the public work side. And we've already seen some cross training amongst those teams. And they'll be working more closely together this year with a newly funded, not newly funded, but um, a funded position that we plan to fill this year. And so the synergy in the engineering side, there's also synergies that we're seeing in the fiscal side where they can rely on each other back and forth. And it's really been um, very successful. And then I think the last bit of it is, is all that together is improved communication and coordination on large projects, on permit reviews, and it's been been successful. But all that said, change does take time. So I think we need to be patient as we see these improvements come to fruition. Yeah, I especially want to mention uh, Steve Wiesner, a uh, fifth district resident and uh, in charge of your road crews. What yeah, I call him, and boy, he gets back to somebody in in nanoseconds, it seems like. And Carolyn Burke has been phenomenal too. Uh, but uh, I just in working with um, Dave Reed and uh, the planning department, which you're doing now, uh, it's going to pay really good uh, public service dividends, I think, in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. I'll make some brief comments as well. Um, I mean, when you first joined the county, you probably didn't think that we'd literally hand every single department under your purview. <laughs> but uh, congratulations. It's it's a statement of faith in your abilities, which I think are are, are superior. I think you do an outstanding job, Director Machado. Um, I'll say, too, that, uh, you know, there are... I, I would presume, at least because this is what occurs in the second district, the number one and number two issue that we receive inquiries are about are about public works related issues or transportation issues and planning related issues. And I think that I understand the frustration when people come up to the board to express their concerns or send us the emails that they send or make the calls that they make maybe with uh, not the tone that their mom would have encouraged them to use when they reach out to our offices. But I really think that the people in your departments are outstanding. Um, and I think that they're unbelievably responsive and there is a significant cultural shift. And there's not like there's somebody in there saying, oh, I wish uh, it would take longer for a permit, right? I mean, people are working really hard and you know, we have over 150,000 unincorporated residents. I don't think people recognize from a structural standpoint how different our county is from most other counties that we're really providing municipal services, but under the funding structure of a state rural agency, basically with half of what we do being state and federal mandates. So it's structurally flawed that that burden is not borne or that responsibility isn't borne by your staff, but the burden is borne by your staff. And I, I want to acknowledge in particular on the planning side, uh, Ms. Burke and Ms. Hansen, I mean, I mean, 150,000 people, and I, I swear if there's an issue that we have, they're willing to call them back individually and, and spend a half hour with them. And uh, while thinking about systems reform, while thinking about how the policies need to change, and uh, both of you are just outstanding leaders in your department, I appreciate the culture that you're creating on the planning side and on the public works and transportation side. And to, to, Mr., to Supervisor McPherson's point, you know, Mr. Wiesner is, has done unbelievable work and in, in with very little money and we've tried to, to change the structure on the funding with measure d and, and the sp1 advocacy work and the work that you and i've done on the federal side to try and bring in money but at the end of the day a few hundred million dollars in deferred maintenance just on the transportation side 400 million on the culverts which run underneath the roads and make the roads fail you know we're, we're talking about realistically close to a billion dollars in deferred maintenance on infrastructure costs on a macro level just in the unincorporated area obviously can't be solved by Steve Wiesner, right? But but the um, but I mean we we have a lot of faith in you, my man. But I don't I'm not you know or or Kent because we're also moving into a little bit of other other issues there. But what I wanted to just put is the perspective of the amount of work um, and the fact that what you have are people that want to get things done and they all live in this community. I mean we're all so they 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 care and your team cares and, and appreciate that work. And there isn't a single thing that we do up here that isn't touched by your department. I mean, Kimberly's amazing work on the South County Service Center, for example, every single thing that we talk about from a policy perspective, the Papua River, River Levy project. And I mean, you know, Kent had worked on, on that with us and going to DC for advocacy that every single project has touches these two departments. And so we just want you to know that we appreciate uh, the work that you all do.
Um, all right, so I'm gonna open it up for the community. Is there anybody in chambers that would like to address us on the CDI budget for 23-24? Good morning still and welcome back. Good morning, Becky Steinbrenner. Thank you for the report. You indeed have a lot on your plate. <laughs> And I want to thank you for always being so responsive whenever I reach out to you in emails. It's it's excellent. And thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I, I really want to applaud you for focusing on the emergency routes in our, uh, our county, uh, the evacuation routes, and hope that more, uh, that some Measure D money can be spent on resurfacing those routes. Um, I, I know that the Measure D money tends to all get spent within the urban services line, but our rural roads really are in need of a lot of work, as you know. And these are the evacuation routes for our rural residents, and it affects a lot of people. So um, I hope that there will be some turnouts uh, engineered into future work along these these emergency routes so that people evacuating can get out and incoming response engines can get in safely. Thank you. Um, I, I really am glad there's going to be some attention and money spent toward a culvert, deferred culvert. I also want to bring out bridges. The 1928 Aptos Creek Bridge has uh, some serious scouring and there's metal protruding up in the deck that is a real hazard. So I hope that uh, there's some attention to that venerable bridge. I'm curious why the Davenport Recycled Water Project, such a great project is not being used uh, for agricultural irrigation. And I understand why, but but I would like to see that water taken down to um, the city for use in the city and to add hydrants along the way so that if there are fires again up in that area, fire engines can fill up at hydrants along the way rather than going in on private property. Um, I, I would like to see some composting centers put out at county parks, maybe the sheriff's center to reduce, uh, encourage uh, composting. And I'd like to see some recovery satellite service centers put in the CZU area. Thank you, Ms. Steinbrenner. Thank you. Is there anybody else in chambers that would like to address us on this item? I'm clerk, anybody online? No speakers have raised their hand online. Okay, then we'll bring it back to the board. A motion will be appropriate. Supervisor Hernandez. You know, I, I got a quick, quick comment before I, I make the motion. You know, there's been uh, several counties that are looking at equity criteria for road resurfacing. And I know that this year the storm has taken precedence and recovery as well. Uh, but it'd be uh, nice to see if we can place equity uh, in the formula. And I think that in the future that'll help projects like Murphy Road in the future. That being said, um, I'd like to move approval of the proposed budget for community development and infrastructure department. Second. Or we have a motion for the recommended actions from Supervisor Hernandez and a second from Supervisor Koenig. We have a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Hernandez. Yes. McPherson and Friend. Aye, and that passes unanimously. Thank you, Director Machado. Thank you to your team. Thank you. And our Final item on the regular agenda before we have a closed session item is item nine, which is to consider approval of the 23-24 proposed budget for capital projects, including any supplemental materials and take related actions as outlined in the budget documents and recommended by the CAO. We have the board memo, the budget detail, the supplemental budget, the project details list. And we have our assistant CEO, Lisa Benson, and our senior administrative analyst. Mr. Friedrich, and we've got others that are now. Yeah, you know, it's like it's just. I feel like we're being it's a village to build right. a village. Well, right. good afternoon, or nearly afternoon, uh, chair, friend, and board members. Um, as you know, I'm Elisa Benson, and and with me today to present our capital but projects budget proposed budget for general government parks and general fund is Brian Friedrich, our senior administrative analyst who does. An incredible amount of work to support this this program, and then we have uh, our leaders from our capital implementing departments, Parks, GSD, and Travis Carey from CDI. Next slide, please. So today we're going to give a quick overview of what capital projects are and the process we utilize to bring the proposal that's before you today. Ryan's going to walk through the overall budget. 
and, and our department partners will do a deeper dive into the, the prioritized projects um, that are recommended for additional funding and new funding. I'll close out with a quick review of opportunities and challenges, and then we'll get to recommended actions. This isn't important because it's a little bit different than some of the other ones you've heard uh, this morning and yesterday, as stated in the memo before you, we uh, we have a little bit more work to do. So one of those recommended actions is going to be to bring you some additional final project list and funding decisions on last day. With that, very quickly, although all of you know what capital projects are, I wanted to just give a quick reminder for the viewing public. Um, these are our dollars that we invest to maintain or improve our physical assets that, that are owned by the county. Uh, this is everything from county owned buildings, government, uh, the sheriff facilities, libraries, parks, beaches, non-buildable lands. Uh, Director Machado walked through sort of more of what we would call the public works oriented uh, projects this morning. This is really gonna be focusing on our county facilities and our parks. So just as a reminder, we own a. Uh, over, we own or lease over 100, 159 buildings across dozens of campuses. We have 1.4 million square feet of county uses and 70% of our county facilities were built before 1989. So that just gives you a sense of, we have some deferred maintenance uh, that, that, in, that we have to deal with every year and we never have enough money. We also have over 14, 1,400 acres of parkland that are in public, public publicly accessible open spaces, playgrounds, picnic areas, pools, coastal vistas and stairways and more. So this is a large portfolio of property that we're managing. All right, I wanna speak a little bit about how did we actually get to the proposal that's before you today. Back in 2021, uh, CAO, CAO Palacios requested that we establish a capital projects review committee. And the membership of that committee is, is, is listed here. The purpose of the CPRC is really to modernize and update the county's approach to capital budgeting and monitoring the delivery of those projects of the life of those projects. And over the last two years, we have spent considerable time updating how we do that work. Uh, we, we have a much more systematic approach for getting project proposals from our departments. They are reviewed in alignment with the criteria. And then we bring those proposals forward to you. We never have enough funding, as, uh, as I mentioned. And this year we received 73 project proposals, 22 major project proposals, and a slate of 51 minor project proposals. The budget that Ryan's gonna talk about today has six new major projects and 17 deferred maintenance projects. So, you know, we are not able to do everything we would like to do. I wanna talk a little bit about some of those improvements we've made in terms of how do we even determine how to invest those limited dollars. This key improvement has been uh, developing a way to evaluate capital projects. And this is our second year of applying a scoring rubric. And right here, it just gives you a, a snapshot of what are the factors we're looking at as we determine which projects to put forward to you all for consideration. I'm gonna, the next slide, I'll talk a little bit more how, about how we're centering equity, but really obviously there's financial impact. What, and is it fully funded? Is it, is it best leveraging general fund and, and grant dollars? Health and safety, how does that address health and safety for our employees and for our, for our community members who use our services? Is it, what's the community facing benefit of a project? And then there's always that environmental sustainability and overall plans, whether they're parks master plans, our strategic plan, a variety of different things where we are, our long range facility plan that you all blessed, a variety of policy documents that guide our investments. So again, I wanted to spend a little bit of time to talk about how we are setting, centering equity in this work. And this just gives you a flavor of what we're asking our, um, our capital project teams to start thinking about as, as they put these together with their, their sort of sponsoring departments. This is new work for these, this group of staff. Um, we continue to work on it every year, try and help staff with training and accessing data, but it's allowing us to really better understand how these physical investments we're making can benefit our community members. 
So with that, I'm giving you a little bit of a sense of the process of how we got to the, the recommendation before you. I'm going to turn it over to Ryan. Anyway, thanks to you, Lisa. <clears throat> Uh, as mentioned, I'm Brian Friedrich. Uh, I'm the, the lead staff support for the, the Capital Projects Review Committee, and I help craft the Capital Projects budget each year. And, and we do so in tandem with our departments and our project managers. And I want to give a, a, a special thanks and shout out to our project managers and our departmental analysts who provide a lot of the uh, analytical support behind uh, getting this together. The Capital Projects budget behaves a little bit differently than the department budgets you've seen in, during these hearings as these figures are tied to the funding needs for each project's given scope of work. Capital projects have specific accounting requirements. Um, they pull financing from many sources. They leverage county debt. And most importantly, they span often several years, uh, leading to millions of dollars rolling over from one year to the next. The FY24 budget includes $20.6 million in new project costs for active and ongoing projects, as well as for new projects. That's balanced against $15.6 million in revenues and a $5 million contribution from the general fund. The revenue sources that, that help our, our capital projects budget include an infusion of AB109 funds to help with the juvenile hall project, state and federal funds to help support health and human service facilities, philanthropic donations for several park projects, and park dedication funds that are collected through development fees. This funding has a cumulative effect on the overall capital projects portfolio, and it represents a new infusion of funds to support active and new projects. And that is different from our departmental budgets, which were often incremental in change. And the capital project is created more from a zero base budget than really from a base budget from one year to the next. So with that in mind, I wanna provide a high level summary of the entire capital projects portfolio that the county manages. At a high level, there's over $91 million in active projects, active and new projects. This includes $70.5 million from previous years. That includes funding for projects like the Sheriff's DNA Lab that we heard about earlier this morning, the Children's Residential Crisis Center, the South County Government Center at 500 Westridge, the Aptos Library, and more. As mentioned, the proposed FY24 amount of $20.6 million provides needed infusions to these active projects and funding for new projects. The graph below is one of my favorite visuals that helps us see the entire capital projects portfolio. Each box uh, in this graph represents an individual project and is proportioned to its size of funding. Blue boxes are facilities projects and green projects. Or green boxes are park projects. In total, there are 34 facility projects, new and active, and 16 park projects. And this is a lot of information to see on one, on one slide. So uh, attached to today's board memo and also uh, active online is a link to a table that provides details for each project as a current snapshot of current year allocations and the proposed FY24 allocations. The life of these project budgets are often various in size and in type and category and complexity. And we're joined by our department leads who are responsible for bringing these projects to completion. I'll start with facility projects that are led by Travis Carey, the Director of Capital Projects Group Property within the Community Development Infrastructure Department and his team. The CDI team manages 11 active projects with over $61 million in current funding. These projects are some of the largest and most complex in our county's portfolio. And Travis is here to provide an update and a look ahead. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, I just want to give a quick shout out to my team um, in Capital Projects. Couldn't do this work without them. They're so uh, dedicated to the projects and they really demonstrate ownership. And that's the project management team and, of course, the real property team. And we also have the GIS uh, Lucy specialist on the Capital Projects team. So with the South County uh, Government Center, this is one of our new acquisitions. It's a 120,000 square foot building on nine acres down in, in Watsonville at 500 West Ridge Drive. West Ridge Drive. And uh, the purpose of this project, you know, consolidating county services, we're going to have HSD, the Ag Commissioner, Ag Extension, Auditor, Treasurer, Tax Collector, County Clerk, and other uh, satellite services at this facility. So really implementing the consolidation of leases and, you know, enhancing our long-term fiscal uh, uh, stability and access to county critical services. And we're really excited about the Children's uh, Residential Crisis Unit. Another new acquisition, a 30,000 square foot facility at 5300 SoCal Drive or Avenue. And um, it's, at the, it's the fourth building in the Sheriff's Headquarters site. And we're really excited to be bringing this project forward uh, for the really uh, critical children's uh, crisis services um, supported by HSA. And we're also working on the juvenile hall and gym renovations, which is a comprehensive renovations to that uh, aging facility. And uh, 
both Aptos Library and uh, Live Organics Libraries are uh, well under construction. Next slide. Thanks, Ryan. Um, so our goals here, uh, we're really looking forward to completing the Aptos and the Live Oak Annex libraries. And so we're targeting uh, the summer and fall of this year for completion of those projects to wrap up the library construction uh, program. And we're really excited also, the, the picture you see here is the uh, South County Government Center. This is the main lobby here, so it's well under construction. And we're hoping to wrap up construction here in December, 2023, and then departments will start moving in in the first part of 2024. Um, and then we're also looking at the completion of design for the children's crisis. Hopefully we'll get to construction in June of next year. And then uh, we're just getting started on uh, the design phase for the South County Health Services Project to implement the Freedom Boulevard Master Plan. I'm looking at some site alternatives there and look forward to bringing that contact to the board on June 27th to start design on that project. And then uh, finally, um, starting construction on the Juvenile Hall Project I mentioned earlier, hopefully get to uh, permits and, and bidding for construction finally on that project. Um, so challenges, you know, we're, we continue to work in this really uh, challenging environment with construction cost increases and a lot of uncertainty in the industry and the uh, economy. Um, but we're looking for opportunities and we've, we've seen those with some of our acquisitions that we've been able to complete lately, really good uh, sites for the, the county facilities and looking at new leases as well. So with that, I'll turn it back to Ryan. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Travis. <laughs> Facilities projects led by our general service department, they often go unnoticed with little fanfare. That's a bit by design, because without their work, our community buildings would quickly fall into a state of disrepair. GSD leads 16 projects totaling nearly $17 million in funding. They address building, major building systems like HVAC or power generators or a slate of minor improvements. Michael Beaton, the director of general services, is here to speak more about his team's important work. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Uh, before I start, I really want to say uh, a big thank you to my facilities team and the team that manages all the capital construction projects that we have on the facility side of the house. Uh, with all the duct tape and glue that they uh, provide in our buildings to make sure that we operate, um, it's amazing that uh, we keep the lights on sometimes. But uh, some of the major projects that we have and have been faced with lately is what we call uh, lately uh, boiler palooza. Uh, with a relationship to the failed uh, heating and cooling, uh, the heating systems that we have through quite a few of our different buildings. An example is 701 Ocean Street, the building that we sit in today. Uh, the building heat provided to us today is uh, supplied through three boilers uh, that provide heat. Two of those boilers have had catastrophic failures and are not operating currently. So the heat that we're enjoying today is provided by one boiler. Uh, we have a project that's gonna be replacing both of that boilers, but they're done as an emergency type project. Just to give you an example, what we call Boiler Palooza. We're also replacing boilers at the Roundtree Correctional Facility, uh, Main Jail Facility, uh, and the M-Line Campus at the uh, Building K. We continue to work on our uh, backup power supply uh, projects uh, with the main jail generator should be completed here in about two months. Uh, we have design specs now for our Roundtree Correctional Facility and we're anticipating uh, going out uh, or uh, starting construction here, uh, at least on the infrastructure piece of it uh, within five months and ordering the generator itself. We're having some significant lead times of approximately 52 months. So that project will be delayed based on uh, uh, lead times of actually procuring the generator uh, that we have, as well as generator projects for our MLine campus. Uh, we are proud that uh, we actually just received an award of about $750,000 to help address the Roundtree water well um, uh, system. We should be bringing that item to your board probably in about August or so to accept the award of the funding uh, to help, help us uh, put in a state-of-the-art uh, water infiltration system, a water filtration system uh, at our Roundtree Correctional Facility. Uh, we continue to support the sheriffs with the DNA uh, lab. We actually just received uh, the bid proposal for that sure enough, uh, sheriff DNA lab and proud to say that it was actually $200,000 under our engineer estimate. Uh, so that project does look like it'll be proceeding forward uh, as planned and on schedule, actually a little bit faster than the schedule, uh, which is great. Uh, and we continue to work with the CDI on the Unified Permit Center uh, and what that design might look like moving forward. Some of the goals uh, that we're looking at for next year uh, and the goals that we've had in the past is with the limited amount of resources and financial resources that we have in our county is to really determine where those financial resources should be invested. 
through a facility condition indexing, uh, which takes all our county buildings and identifies them based on their state of disrepair and the infrastructure that's within those facilities, it'll start giving us a, a smarter list of where we should actually be investing our money, which boilers we should be repairing, which HVAC units we should be repairing, which air handlers we should be repairing. Uh, so we're kind of excited. That project's about 70% 70, 70 complete. We had a contractor come in and complete all buildings through our I don't say all buildings, uh, about 35 of our buildings, uh, they completed in April, uh, and we're just now starting to get some of the reports back. And that's really gonna help guide us of going through the CPRC process and recommendations of where we should smartly be placing our money at and which buildings we should be, uh, I think it's time to tear it down and, and, and build something else. We're also looking at to uh, speed up those projects. So once we identify the projects that we want to invest in, uh, we are looking at uh, this board approved job order contracting, which is a mechanism to allow us to uh, speed up when we identify a project that needs to be repaired. Uh, we're looking at getting that fully implemented as well as increasing our customer service because at the end of the day, uh, what general services does is to ensure that the uh, client departments that we have can provide services to their consumers without having to worry about custodial, without having to worry about the lights being on, without having to worry about the cleanliness of the restrooms. So it's really about increasing our customer service uh, is one of the goals we have. Challenges obviously are the aging infrastructure of our county buildings, uh, the continued deferred maintenance, and our significant building failures. Uh, the boilers I identified as just one area that we've recently had. Um, falling through our different buildings, but we also have um, a lot of uh, what's called variable fan drives that are failing throughout our county buildings uh, that we are smartly replacing one at a time, but they, they're they not cheap, very costly. We also have a challenge looking at the South County Government Center and when that building comes online, there's about 60 or so HVAC units on the roof that ultimately will have to be maintained by general services and the team that we have. So these are just some of the challenges that we have with general services and the county buildings we have. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Thanks, Michael. Uh, all right, last but certainly not least, um, park projects have some of the highest of community visibility. And as my five-year-old would say, they're the most fun. Parks is leading 16 projects totaling 9.4 million in funding. Uh, park projects aim to enhance the outdoor and recreational experiences for county residents and visitors alike, all while addressing environmental stewardship, public health, and cultural vitality. To speak more about this exciting work is Rebecca Hurley, who's a Deputy Director of Parks, Open Spaces, and Cultural Services. Thank you, Ryan. So some of the major projects that the Parks Department is currently working on or commencing uh, are a reflection of the Board of Supervisors' previous priorities. And we look forward to um, working on these as well as hopefully more in many coming years. South County Parkland acquisition and development is something that the Parks Department has already expressed. We I, are hoping to increase the amount of places that we manage in South County along with programming. And ideally with over 1400 acres of parks uh, acreage that we manage, only 100 acres of those are athletic fields. So we'd like to see if we can find a site that also will help us increase the amount of the athletic fields that we provide to the community at large. <laughs> With the Anna Jean Cummings water main re replacement, although it's not as fun as Ryan's five-year-old might think, it is fiscally and environmentally responsible. As we have a leak failure in the main line, it's under the asphalt driveway, and it takes sometimes months for us to know that it's there after thousands of gallons of water have been wasted, as well as increases in water utility bills in upwards of $20,000 a month. The project cost is between $600,000 to $700,000 for the main line replacement with the potential to also replace the main lateral irrigation line. Ideally, there will be low impact on park users as the water line runs up the asphalt driveway from the, upper to, from the lower to upper bent. The Willowbrook County Park in honor of projects in honor of Sergeant Damon Gutzweiler is a three project phase um, project to reimagine that entire park. It includes the installation of a new flagpole and um, Imp improvements to the baseline drive entryway, as well as re redoing the play structure and in, in putting in new pour in place play surfacing, as well as the memorial seating area in honor of Damon, uh, Sergeant Damon Gutzweiler. You'll see in this picture, these are granite boulders that we brought in from the Sierra Nevadas that are a part of the se seating area and we look forward to its completion in the fall. Next slide. So some of the goals that we have for the parks projects are to not only complete some of the planned um, projects, but as well as the unplanned ones. 
We had, as it's been mentioned, over approximately $8 million in storm damages to county parks. In this picture, you'll see these are the improvements that we've done so far at Heart of Soquel, which was completely covered in water during the atmospheric river events. We also would like to complete the environmental review reports for a potential Boulder Creek Pocket Park in downtown Boulder Creek, and also finalize the plans and specifications for Moran Lake Access and Restoration Plan, ideally starting that project with grant funds in the future. Some of the challenges that we anticipate are simultaneous multi-project management and staff's ability to conduct all those projects, as well as revenue disruption during future and construction projects. Thank you, Elisa. Thanks, Rebecca. So I'll really quickly go through some future considerations. Um, clearly, continue to improve our capital planning and asset management. What this really looks like is building out strong systems to track and monitor our capital projects from conception through implementation. It's not something that we uh, have had in the past and Ryan is, that is one of Ryan's projects for this next year. The other piece Michael touched on, it's really having the modern approach of uh, facility contingent, facility condition index reports that really guide what we're doing. And we more systematically approach the significant deferred maintenance that we have inherited. Second, it's continuing to build our skills and practice to apply an equity lens to capital investment. Our goal is to improve both access to and the quality of facilities that advance safety, wellness, and equitable opportunity for low income and BIPOC residents and businesses in our community. This is a new area for capital staff to be looking. So again, I wanna stress, I've been so appreciative and thankful of every department team member who's been part of the work to understand how these investments make a difference in their community. Third, while mostly outside of our control, our capital project management teams work diligently to execute projects in the face of a volatile inflationary marketplace. And as Michael said, frequently with very long lead times. This does not make for happy customers, but it's the reality we manage every day. And lastly, these projects are complex and evolving and demanding, and it requires really high quality project managers. So it's critical for us to be able to retain and recruit the staff we have. And I just want to ex you know, express our appreciation and thanks for the teams that work on these projects. They are very competitive uh, competitive staff that, that have a place in the private market. So we're very, very lucky to have them working for our county. So finally, we're at recommended actions. We. I wanna just speak a little bit to the second item there. As mentioned in the memo, most importantly, it's to direct this RCAO team to return on June 13th with a finalized project list that incorporates additional funding from current year capital fund balances in alignment with board's established priorities. So we do have a little bit more work to do. So please expect to see that uh, on Tuesday the 13th. We're pleased to take any questions. Thank you, Ms. Benson. Are there questions from board members? Uh, Supervisor Koenig? Oh, I'm sorry. What? I mean, I'll, I'll just say in general, this is, a, I think, a bright spot in uh, the county budget, all these projects, which are um, I mean, moving forward, the ball forward in multiple ways, whether it's the parks projects or the children's crisis, uh, residential program, um, facility that we're building in, in Live Oak, or of course, the South County Government Center. And these are really the ex exciting things we can point to and, and show the public that we're moving forward. Um, and it's, of course, about three quarters of it is funded by grants, uh, essentially. So that's uh, one area where we can be thankful in terms of how, how the cookie has crumbled uh, as, as far as the state and federal money that we're getting. Um, I mean, of course, really the larger concern, I think, it, it, in the big picture is how we take care of all those buildings that were built before 1989 uh, and continue to prop that up. Um, I think you do, the general service team does an amazing amount of work uh, and, and a great job with, with a uh, limited budget. Um, I appreciate that you get ahead of things with the uh, just the inventory list that you're creating this year of the different county facilities. And that'll be helpful, I think, in future planning efforts. Uh, but thank you all. Thank you, Supervisor Cummings. I want to appreciate staff coming and giving us this update and providing that presentation to us today. Um, just 
goes to show we got a lot to do and um you know little by little we're going to continue to make progress on all of our deferred maintenance um and to all these capital projects that we have coming before us but also do want to express appreciation of you know the south county government center which is something that will really help us address equity in terms of people's ability to access their local government and um and also helps us as we're thinking about our climate and you know having a center that's in watsonville will reduce people's need to have to drive all the way up to santa cruz and back and for people who need to commute from um, South County and beyond, um, allow them to have a hub where they can have easier access to employment and providing services to people within the community in the South County. Um, and I'll just a quick comment with the athletic fields. I have been hearing some folks who are interested in seeing us uh, bring rugby or rugby field to Santa Cruz County. So just uh, keep that in mind when we're thinking about athletic fields as well, because I know there's some interest in, in having expansion of rugby here in Santa Cruz. So I'll end my comments there. Thank you. Are you, are you going to be the captain of the team? <laughs> See. All right. What's up? <laughs> Supervisor McPherson. Yeah. What really impresses me is uh, this, this uh, you're addressing everything throughout there, all the sections of the county, uh, which was mentioned in the South County, uh, you know, with the, um, uh, with the uh, Watson, Watsonville Hospital should be included in that too. And thank you to, to Carlos Palacios and so much of our team. And the government center uh, expansion there, that, that is going to be cut, I think about 10 to 20% of our personnel will eventually be housed there. And so that's going to cut down a lot of traffic from uh, in mid county. Uh, I do appreciate the the juvenile hall improvements that are going to be made. It was mentioned by a probation department uh, chief. Uh, Fernando Geraldo yesterday in the mid county, the uh, Christ uh, Children's Residential Crisis Center. Um, with what you do, with what you have, is amazing. It's really impressive, and uh, some of the things that we have to address are just uh, maintenance and deferred maintenance, and there's still plenty of it. But uh, we have to keep up uh, with what we have, keep it working well, and uh, what you've done to address this with uh, throughout the county and make everybody included throughout the county is uh, is again is truly impressive. So thank you very much for what you've done. Thank you, Supervisor Hernandez. Did you have something to add? No. All right. Um, before we open up the the public, just like to appreciate uh, Mr. Beaton's work. You know, GSD is we all know stands for getting stuff done. It doesn't actually. Stand. I mean, with, I, I'm sure it stands for something else. We can't say it in a public meeting, but but I mean, it doesn't stand for general services. It's just an old, outdated name. So I appreciate your team doing everything you can to get stuff done on behalf of just not just this um, not just the county, but the entire uh, community as well. So we we'll now open it up. To the community, is there anybody in chambers that would like to address us on the capital projects budget? Good early afternoon and welcome. Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. Um, you, you mentioned in your report about philanthropic donations. And that brings me back to what I talked to you earlier about the Burt Scott estate. The, the Scott estate donated that land and Scott Park to the county. And up on the hill above Scott Park on Freedom Boulevard is a dilapidated, falling apart, beautiful home and a caretaker's building with beautiful, once beautiful gardens just falling apart because the county's doing nothing with it. And the county used to hold meetings there. They used to do things there, but it's been allowed to fall into a state of disrepair to the point that when I mentioned out in the hallway with um, Mr. Gaffney, why don't we make it into housing? He said, it's not safe, but there's no plan to do anything with it. Now, how can the county expect to continue to receive philanthropic donations like this major real estate piece from the Scott family affiliated with granite construction when the county does nothing with it and lets it fall into such a disappointing state of repair, disrepair. This needs to be addressed. And instead of doing some of these new grandiose projects, why don't we take care of what we have? That property could be renovated and become an event center, a conference center, a, a, a retreat center, and be a moneymaker for the county. Instead, it's being allowed to go into disrepair and could be um, a fire hazard if the vagrants find out about it. So please do something with the Burt Scott estate. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's got to be done. Um, I notice on the um, report that 
the Bonnie Doon fire station fuel tank project was not on there. That was an ongoing emergency thing that actually expanded into the boiler palooza that Mr. Beaton um, talked about. And that was a major thing. I'd like to see solar panels put out in our parking lots here at 701 Ocean Street. Rio College is doing an amazing job. The Thank county you, has Senator. done some at five Thank sites. You. Thank you, Ms. Steinbrenner. Is there anybody else? My two in, minutes went quickly. Is there anybody in else in Chambers would like to address this on the capital projects? Okay, we'll close comment from Chambers. Is there anybody online? We have no speakers online for this item. Okay, I'll close public comment and bring it back to the board for a motion. Is there a motion? Second. All right, we have a motion from Supervisor McPherson, a second from Supervisor Koenig. If we could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Um, Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Yes. McPherson? And Fred? Aye. And that passes unanimously. And thank all of you for your work. Uh, the board will move into closed session. Is there anything anticipated to be reportable out of closed session? No. Okay. Then our next regular scheduled board meeting is June 13th, I believe, and we'll see you here then. Thank you.